This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Support Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 198th edition of the program. Today is Friday, June 21st, and before we get into the show, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up just this last week to support us for the very first time, or increased their monthly pledge, and that includes Alex Clayton Kerr, Andy Passmore, Jorge Miranda, Michael, Michael Elling, Randy Aronoff, Siddiqui Cleaning Service, Stephanie Hayes, Thomas R. Skillman, Tim Slattery, Tassin Ajig 2, and Wendy Roberts. So thank you so much to all of these kind souls. If you'd also like to support the show, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support or by checking out patreon.com forward slash humanistreport or underneath any one of our YouTube videos, you can click join and support us that way and become a member that easily. So this week on the Humanist Report podcast, we'll talk about Donald Trump's unhinged interview with ABC News and how it was unintentionally hilarious. Mitch McConnell expands the definition of socialism. Candace Owens goes full SJW to own the libs. Bernie Sanders dismantles the Trump administration's anti-Iran propaganda. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez blasts Trump's fascistic immigration policies and conservatives cried because of it. Amazon responded to AOC's critique of their exploitative labor practices. Joe Biden talks about getting cozy with white supremacists. Bernie Sanders sparks outrage over what some saw as an attack on Elizabeth Warren. And finally, we closed the week by talking to 2020 congressional candidate Joshua Collins of Washington State's 10th congressional district. So that's what he's got on the agenda for today. I hope you guys enjoy the show. So as many of you know, President Donald Trump was interviewed by George Snephalophagus, combination of Stephanophilus and Snephalophagus, I think I just created. But nonetheless, he was interviewed by ABC News, and um, it was incredibly interesting. I found it fascinating and entertaining. Was it of any value to us as voters? No, I don't really feel like watching this gave me information that, you know, would help me make a more informed decision at the voting booth. But with that being said, with every single long form Donald Trump interview, like a train wreck, you've got to watch. Because even if, you know, you might feel a little bit dumber coming away from it, at least you know you're entertained. And this interview was no different. So I'm going to share my favorite moments from this interview because there were a lot. My first, um, not necessarily my favorite moment, but one thing that really stood out to me is when Donald Trump said this. I like the truth. You know, I'm actually a very honest guy. You know, I'm actually a very honest guy. (laughs) (laughs) You've literally lied more than 10,000 times since you became president. 10,000 times. And I love how, as he's saying it, even he knows that it's hard to believe because he states... Oh, you know, I actually like the truth. He has to throw in actually because he knows that it's so surprising to everyone given that he lies approximately 30 times a day. Literally. Now, moving on, we got to a discussion about 2020 and polls came up. And as many of you know, Donald Trump isn't performing too well. Now, these are all early polls, but when you look at general election matchups, Trump v. Biden, Bernie v. Trump. Trump is getting whooped. Now, George Stephanopoulos, Snuffleupagus, asked him about this, and his response was just bizarre. This is a guy who does everything to separate and frighten people. It was fun. I mean, it's a political speech. He's still leading the polls on the Democratic side. It's tightening up a little bit. And it's or, tightening up a lot, which is interesting. But he's still beating you, according to the polls. Well, I don't believe those polls. There's no way he beats me in Texas. But even your own polls show you're behind right now, don't they? No. My polls show that I'm winning everywhere. 
I don't know. We've yeah. we've all seen these reports that 15 out of 17 states, you spent two million on a poll, and you're behind in 15 out of 17 states. Nobody showed you those polls because those polls don't exist, George. Those polls don't exist. But I just had a meeting with somebody that's a pollster, and I'm winning everywhere. Wow. <laughs> Mr. President, I've seen these polls that show you're pretty far behind. No, you haven't seen these polls. Excuse me? You haven't seen these polls because they don't exist. Oh, okay. I mean, what do you even say to that? What do you say when you tell somebody something that you saw with your own eyes and then they say, no, don't believe your lying eyes? What do you even say to that? Now, this happened after this discussion came up. Uh, we're getting tremendous polls. Those poll results so irritating to the president that a few seconds later, he has to go off the record to call his campaign manager. Okay, so hold it off for a little while. Just call Brad on the phone. And I want to ask him that question, okay? Days later, we would get the internal Trump polling data confirmed by the campaign. It showed the president far behind in key battleground states earlier this spring. <laughs> <laughs> so after confidently saying that he has quote unquote tremendous polls, which I love, um, turns out that what George said was confirmed. Their own internal polling data shows that he's kind of in trouble. But Donald Trump is a narcissist, so he can never admit to anything that makes him look bad. Now, what do you say? What what's an honest response to that? If you still you know, you, you don't want to admit that you're behind and you want to make yourself look good. What would you say? Something that would have been actually truthful and more believable was, look, these are very early polls, George. So you can't really put too much faith into what they say now. But just know that you can't count me out of this yet because polls can change. I was behind in the polls in head-to-head -head matchups in 2016 as well. And then that changed. I ended up winning. So you can say something like that. But what does he do? Well, he just denies that these polls exist when his own team had to confirm that. I mean, how embarrassing is this to Donald Trump? So there wasn't much policy in this interview, but he did talk about health care. And what he said here was just incredibly bizarre and downright wrong. What is the big unfinished piece of business you're going to say, this is what we're going to get done? So we almost had health care done. Health care is a disaster, Obamacare. But we've managed it much better than they managed it. So we've made it serviceable, but it's not great. We're going to produce phenomenal health care, and we already have the concept of the plan, and it'll be much Don't better. Tell people what the plan is. Yeah, well, we'll be announcing that in about two months, maybe less. After dismantling Obamacare, basically death by a thousand cuts, he says that they've made Obamacare more serviceable. In what way? You've just dismantled portions of it. There are 25 million people that are underinsured. 30 million that are not insured. How many millions of Americans lost insurance since you became president because of what you did to the Affordable Care Act? And what does he say? We're going to produce phenomenal health care, and we already have the concept of the plan, and it'll be much better health care. Okay, great. Well, can we see it? Oh, we'll unveil it in like two months, maybe sooner. In other words, you don't have a plan. You never had a plan. And anything that he's proposed or that the Republican Party has proposed polls less than 20 percent because all it does is basically take Obamacare and make it worse. But because Republicans did it to them, it's inherently better because they did it. If Obama did it bad, if Republicans did it good. Now, let me remind you that the Affordable Care Act is a right wing health care proposal. Romney implemented this. This was cooked up by the Heritage Foundation, so they have nothing. And the fact that he still is saying, oh, well, we're going to come up with something. Sure, Jan. Now, he had the right instinct coming into office. He said, we're going to do universal health care. Now, I have no idea what he meant by that, but he was hinting at a single payer type system. And he said, the government's going to pay for it, but it's going to be better. We're going to save money. Like, we all know the clip that I'm referring to. I don't even have to play it. But all it took was one meeting with Paul Ryan and Republicans, and they got him to flip his stance immediately. He asked, why can't we expand Medicare to everyone? And they got him to flip and be against the Affordable Care Act. I mean, he has absolutely no plan when it comes to health care. But moving on. So in this interview, they play a clip 
of Donald Trump supporters, and even if they support Trump and plan to vote for him again in 2020, one thing that they don't like was Donald Trump's mean tweets. They th think that it's, you know, just unnecessary and he needs to stop doing it. This was his response to that. What they're talking about, though, is you're calling people names. It's demeaning. Well, you know what? I'll bet they do like it. They may tell you that, but I'll bet they like it, you know? Uh, Mr. President, some of your supporters who support you, hence the word supporters, they say that they really would prefer that you don't do all of these mean tweets. No, they don't. They like them. I mean, what do you say to that? It'd be like if you went up to Ted Cruz and said, Hey, Ted, you know, I just want to let you know that you have a tonsil stone on your bottom lip. It's kind of embarrassing. And he just said, No, I don't. I mean, this is his response to everything. Tell him something that he doesn't like. And he just denies it. Unbelievable. Um, so I want to get to the next portion of the interview. So they're talking about tax returns and financial disclosures, and he hasn't released them yet, and he won't willfully do that. But listen to what he says about it, because this is so fucking weird that it's honestly impressive. When you will see my financial statement at some point, I assume it's going to be released. You'll be very impressed with the job I've done. Much, much bigger, much, much Which better than statement? anybody. Uh, they're after my financial statement. The Senate, they'd like to get my financial statement. At some point, I hope they get it. You're going to turn it over? No, at some point, I might. But at some point, I hope they get it because it's, <laughs> it's a fantastic financial statement. <laughs> what does he even mean when he says things like this? It's... A fantastic financial statement. Very big numbers. You're going to see big numbers. Trump, what are you talking about? And my favorite part, <laughs> when he talks about his financial statements, George Stephanopoulos says, which financial statement? Trump then follows up by saying, they're after my financial statement. The Senate, they're after my financial statement. Oh, that definitely clears it up. In response to the question, <laughs> which financial statement, he says, my financial statement. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> His brain is melting. And believe it or not, that's not even the best part of that exchange. Because somebody coughed <laughs> as he was bloviating about his financial statement and how we'd all love it if we saw it, which she doesn't want us to see. But somebody coughed, totally threw him off of his game, and it seemed like he was just kind of being playfully, like, you know, irritated. But towards the end, you'll see he was legitimately angered that somebody coughed and interrupted him. It's a fantastic financial statement. And uh, let's do that over. He's coughing in the middle of my answer. Yeah, okay. I don't like that, you know? I don't like your hey, chief of staff. If you're going to cough, please hey, leave the room. Get a shot of and I'll, I'll come over here. Just, just can't, you. you just can't. Just to change the shot. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Trump. Okay, do you want to do that a little differently then? Yeah, or? we just changed the angle. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So at some point, so at some point, I look forward to... <laughs> oh, did you see the death glare? <laughs> That death glare at the end there. Oh, that was so good. That was so good. Wow. All right, so moving on. They get into, you know, 2016, Russian interference, the Trump Tower meeting with Don Jr. And he was asked whether or not, hypothetically speaking, a foreign government said, hey, Trump, we've got dirt on your opponent. And would you like us to give you that to potentially help you out? This is his actual response. Your campaign this time around, if foreigners, if Russia, if China, if someone else offers you information on an opponent, should they accept it or should they call the FBI? I think maybe you do both. I think you might want to listen. I don't, there's nothing wrong with listening. If somebody called from a country, Norway, we have information on your opponent. Oh, I think I'd want to hear it. You want that kind of interference in our elections? It's not an interference. They have information. I think I'd take it. You literally were just under investigation for two years. So wouldn't you just instinctively say, we're not going down that route again. You know, I'm not going to do anything that could possibly be even perceived or seem like I am willing to accept help from a foreign government. Wouldn't you think that 
His instinct would be to just lie about that like he does about everything else, even if truthfully he would accept that knowledge and not contact the FBI. I mean, look, one thing that I think is certain that comes across in this interview is that Donald Trump's mental capacity is rapidly declining. Like when you compare this interview and current interviews, recent interviews with anything he did in 2016, he was able to form more coherent thoughts. He was still, you know, weird and he'd go on these weird rants and whatnot. But compare 2016 to now, the things he says, you know, they're just weird. And I'm not necessarily only referring to his response on, you know, election interference, just in general. But in the event, you know, you were asked this question, what's the right answer? You would say, of course I would reject any help from a foreign government, and I would immediately report that to the FBI, but I'd go a step further, and I would vow to never interfere in another country's elections, as the United States always does. I'm against interference both ways, when we do it and when other countries do it. That'd be the correct answer. Donald Trump just can't help himself, though. Wow. So, with that being said, I just want you all to realize that we may never get a president this dumb ever again. Like, this could be, you know, the only time in our lifetimes where we see a president this stupid. I mean, for everyone who said that George W. Bush was stupid, Donald Trump makes him look like Einstein. And that's not to say that George W. Bush is more moral than Donald Trump, because I think he's actually more destructive than Donald Trump by a mile and a half. With that being said, he's a lot more intelligent than Donald Trump, and it's clear that he struggles to string together a coherent thought, and what often comes out is just this word salad that ends up being the same like five talking points over and over again. Witch hunt, no collusion, polls, uh, I beat Hillary Clinton, you know, the same shit over and over again. I don't, I can't think of the fifth one, but maybe it's four. But with that being said, Jesus Christ, um, that was entertaining. Um, I'm glad I watched it. Didn't learn anything. Probably I'm a little bit dumber because of it. But with that being said, I'm glad I watched that. So I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but I think it's worth repeating again because this is a really important point to make. If you think that Bernie Sanders being a self-proclaimed democratic socialist is going to hurt him in 2020 and make him less electable against Donald Trump, then you have been misled. And I get it. It's difficult to conceive of that because this is what conventional wisdom tells us. It tells us that a social democrat or democratic socialist or anyone who attaches that socialist label to themselves in whatever capacity. They're inherently less electable than, say, a centrist democrat. Media pundits say it, Republicans say it, and even democrats are so worried about the potential toxicity of that socialist label that they're actively conspiring against Bernie Sanders behind closed doors to stop him because they think that's going to facilitate another Trump victory. Now, the underlying assumption with this theory here is that, you know, if a socialist can't beat Trump, then obviously that means we must need a centrist Democrat like Joe Biden to go up against Donald Trump because he's going to be the most electable because Republicans won't be able to use that label to describe Joe Biden, except, oh, wait, They've already done that. In fact, Mike Pence has already accused Joe Biden of advocating for a socialist agenda. And what these people who are worried about socialism and that label don't realize is that anyone who isn't Trump, who goes up against Donald Trump, will automatically, by default, be labeled a socialist. Even a centrist like Obama was labeled a socialist. And in fact, they even call him a communist, which is hilarious to me. But the point is... To Republicans, socialism is literally just a synonym for things that they don't like. That's all it is. So if you honestly believe that that label or that attack will only uniquely affect Bernie Sanders and harm him and nobody else, you have been duped by conservatives. Because whoever the Democratic Party nominee is, left wing or right wing, Joe Biden or Bernie, they will be called a socialist over and over again by Republicans. Because, say it with me, socialism is a synonym for things Republicans don't like. They have a sandwich that they didn't like. That was a socialist sandwich. 
They play a video game that had too many microtransactions in it. That was a socialist video game. This is what they do. That word doesn't mean anything related to political affiliation or political ideology. It just means bad. And to give you another example as to how this word has lost all meaning, we'll go to our friend Mitch McConnell, <clears throat> who's going to call a new thing socialist. And I'll tell you why it's ironic that he's making this argument when we come back. For the first time in my memory, I agree with Nancy Pelosi. I am indeed the Grim Reaper when it comes to the socialist agenda that they've been ginning up over in the House with overwhelming Democratic support and sending it over to America, things that would turn us into a country we've never been. They're on the way to doing some additional things, in addition to the ones they've already done, uh, the Green New Deal, uh, Medicare for All. And by the way, you may have mentioned this on your show, but they didn't plan, uh, plan to, uh, to make the District of Columbia state that given two new Democratic senators, uh, Puerto Rico state would give them two more new Democratic senators. And as a former Supreme Court clerk yourself, you've surely noticed that they plan to expand the Supreme Court. So this is a full uh, bore socialism on the march in the House. And yeah, as long as I'm the majority leader of the Senate, none of that stuff is going anywhere. Okay, so he says statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico is, quote, full bore socialism. Let's just pause for a moment and try to think about what that even means. Statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico is full bore socialism. It doesn't mean anything. He's calling it socialism because he doesn't like that. But what's funny is that by Mitch McConnell's own standards, he just came out as a socialist because if advocacy for D.C. or Puerto Rico and their statehood it makes you a socialist, then I'll let you in on a little secret. The Republican Party is now socialist because this is a quote from their 2016 GOP platform. We support the right of the United States citizens of Puerto Rico to be admitted to the Union as a fully sovereign state. Gotcha, bitch. I don't know about you guys, but uh, that sounds like full bore socialism to me, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Turns out Mitch McConnell is a socialist by his own standards. But look, to be serious here, what that platform really means is that um, we support Puerto Rican statehood so long as Democrats don't also come out in favor of it. In that case, we reserve the right to flip on that because fuck Democrats. If they like something, then it is inherently bad. And now, according to Mitch McConnell, it's literally full bore socialism to support statehood for Puerto Rico. So do you understand what's happening here? Do you see what's going on? If you truly believe that Bernie Sanders is the only candidate that Republicans will weaponize socialism against, then congratulations, you have been duped. And by advocating for a more centrist Democrat in order to increase the chances of us beating Donald Trump, you're playing right into their hands because data suggests another centrist Democrat would lose to Donald Trump. Now, we don't necessarily have to look at data to come to this conclusion, seeing that we just ran an experiment in 2016 where we tried that. And Donald Trump won. But nonetheless, for those of you who are still unconvinced, you've been warned. If you're so worried about socialism making Bernie Sanders or a Democrat less electable, you're already going to be fighting this battle regardless of who you support. If you support Kamala Harris, she's going to be labeled a socialist. If you support Pete Buttigieg, he's going to be labeled a socialist. If you support Amy Klobuchar even, she will be labeled a socialist. Anyone who goes up against Donald Trump will be labeled a socialist. So by saying Bernie Sanders shouldn't be the nominee because he's less electable as a direct result of that socialist label that he uses for himself... You're inadvertently helping Republicans because you're opting for someone who's weaker against Donald Trump. Because again, a centrist Democrat 
can lose to Donald Trump. That's what data suggests. It's what happened in 2016, and it could very well happen again. It's not a foregone conclusion. A corporate Democrat could beat Donald Trump theoretically because there are few people in the country as incompetent as Hillary Clinton. With that being said, though, if you truly want to beat Trump, don't roll the dice and go with another centrist Democrat. Go with someone who actually is a self-identified socialist who can take that label and... Describe what he means by socialist, who can flip it back on Republicans and call them corporate socialists, who can say, you know what, I am a socialist, but this is what I think socialism means to me. And Bernie Sanders did the right thing here. He embraced socialism, but he also called Republican socialists in the sense that they support socialism for large multinational corporations, but only denounce it when it positively impacts the working class. So you've got to understand here. If you're worried about that socialist label, then you're going to worry regardless if Bernie Sanders is the nominee or a centrist Democrat is the nominee. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They'll even call Howard Schultz a socialist because that's just what Republicans do. It's been their strategy for decades now. Anyone who doesn't have an R next to their name is a socialist by their standards. So once and for all, let's stop running away from the word socialism and actually realize that it's not the boogeyman that it used to be, and since Republicans used it for any and everything that they don't like, it no longer has meaning, which gives us the opportunity to ascribe meaning to that word, to redefine it, to use it in a way that benefits us and not them once and for all. But unfortunately, a lot of Democrats, namely strategists in D.C., they don't get this. And, um... The writing's on the wall, so don't think that a corporate Democrat isn't going to be called a socialist, because Mitch McConnell just called statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico full war socialism. Literally anything is socialism that they don't like. Always remember that. When somebody tells you that Bernie Sanders can't win or he's less electable because he's a socialist and Americans would never opt for a socialist. Socialist by Republican standards, is just a synonym for something or someone that they don't like. Period. Candace Owens is a far-right political commentator who has repeatedly sounded the alarm about the big bad SJWs on college campuses. They're a threat to you, they're a threat to me, because these are fascists who are against free speech. They're always protesting and trying to shut down speeches of people that they don't agree with. So in this clip here, she's going to explain, forcefully so, why we shouldn't try to censor people who we disagree with. We should let them speak. These college campuses have essentially become islands of totalitarianism and fascism, and they create a lot of hurdles if and when you do want to bring a conservative speaker to campus. It's a major area of problem in this country, and it's one that has to be countered and tackled. And it's not only that, it's what they're teaching when these speakers come to speak. It's fundamentally anti-Americanism. Linda Sarser is welcomed on every campus, and I am not. So the underlying implication there I think, is that she thinks this is a form of censorship. To not allow someone to speak just because you disagree with them, that's censorship. If we allow the Linda Sarsours of the world to speak on college campuses, then we should certainly allow the Candace Owens of the world to speak on college campuses. Otherwise, that's a form of censorship. Now, with that being said, as a lefty myself, I've never been invited to speak on a college campus ever, so it's good to know that I'm also a victim of censorship. I'm going to put that card in my back pocket for now in case I need to conveniently invoke the victim card in the future, but with that being said, the point is, this is a form of censorship. We shouldn't shut down the speech of people just because we disagree with them. That's her overall point. Now, we'll stick a pin in that conversation and come back to it, but let's just take a moment and speculate why a college campus wouldn't necessarily want to invite someone like Candace Owens to speak. Um, maybe, just maybe, this is only my theory, it's because she says a lot of ahistorical, downright idiotic, factually incorrect things all the time. Case in point. And these are all words that have been said over and over again about black conservatives when they have the audacity to think for themselves and become educated about our history and the myth of things um, like the Southern switch and the Southern strategy, which never happened. What the hell did you just say? <laughs> who would want to invite someone like that who says something like that to college campuses? I mean, that's insane, right?
So this is her shtick. This is what she does. She is constantly trying to disprove the fact that Republicans have been racist and they still are very much racist. It's the same thing that Dave Rubin tries to do. He tries to prove that social conservatives are actually more tolerant than lefties, which is just laughable. But the way that Candace Owens goes about doing this is to just flat out deny history. And the myth of things um, like the Southern switch and the Southern strategy, which never happened. She literally just thanos historical facts like that because she didn't like them. Because they conflict and contradict the narrative that she's constantly trying to push. That easy. You don't like a historical fact? Didn't happen. But with that being said, her overall point is no matter how harmful that speech is, we should be allowed to exercise it. If you don't agree with me, that's perfectly fine. If you think I'm living in an alternate reality, that's my right and I still have the right to express it and tell people about this alternate reality that I have constructed for myself. In fact, according to this cartoon she shared, she claims, quote, thought police have the highest records of brutality against the blacks of all time. Now I know what you're thinking. That's not even a coherent point. What is she even trying to say? Well, the overall point is she should be allowed to make whatever dumb point she wants. Freedom of speech, motherfucker. Either you like it or you don't. That's her point. Except you all know what I'm about to do, right? <laughs> We're going to share a quote from Candace Owens where she's going to completely contradict everything she previously purported to stand for when it comes to free speech. She tweeted, if I were president, the punishment for burning the U.S. flag would be the renunciation of citizenship. No jail time, no fine, simply one year to liquidate your assets and get the hell out of our country. In exchange, we'd extend citizenship to a hardworking legal immigrant. In other words, I don't like this form of free speech because it offends me. So let's ban it because I don't like it. And not only that, not only do I want to ban that form of free speech, I actually want to severely punish people by stripping them of their citizenship if they exercise that speech that I personally view as offensive. I mean, and the left is often called the snowflakes because... Why? Do you understand here? A so-called free speech advocate is saying, if somebody says something that offends me, they should lose their citizenship. How has the right not distanced themselves from her because she's clearly a fraud who is incredibly ignorant? But as Benjamin Dixon pointed out in a recent video, which I will link to, the reason why Republicans are refusing to distance themselves from her is because she basically says all the things that they want to say that would make them seem racist. That's why right-wingers still take her seriously. Because they need people like her. They need people like Dave Rubin to say, you know what? This homophobia, Steven Crowder, it's perfectly acceptable. In fact, your homophobic jokes actually prevents violence because without jokes, I mean, there'd be violence in America. Candace Owens, she comes out here, she says, you know what? What the Republican Party is doing is the right thing. They're not actually the racists with these voter ID laws that disproportionately target black people. It's Democrats who are racist. Benjamin Dixon lays it all out in this video that you should definitely watch. Now, getting back to the issue of free speech, these right-wing grifters like Candace Owens and Dave Rubin, you see, they don't actually care about free speech in the sense that they want to defend the actual First Amendment. What defending free speech means to them is that as individuals, they should have the right to access whatever platform they want at any time. And if you deny them that platform, then you're obviously taking away their free speech and censoring them. And to them, if they don't get to speak on a particular college campus or they face resistance from some students, that's actually a more egregious violation of free speech than literal violations of the First Amendment.
like the anti-BDS laws that we're seeing pop up across the country, which brazenly violate the U.S. Constitution. Now, what's funny is that relating to this issue that Candace Owens brought up, this is already a settled issue. In 1989, the Supreme Court held in Texas v. Johnson that flag burning is a protected form of of speech. Even Justice Scalia, a far-right justice, held that this was protected speech. But I don't even know why I'm talking about that, because that would assume that they care about actual First Amendment issues, when to them, all they care about is them being able to go on these platforms and college campuses and speak and boost their name recognition and, as a result, get more money get more sponsorships, they get more popular, that is directly correlated with the money that they make. But what's funny is that they talk about college campuses and how these SJWs are ruining the country. But what they actually don't tell you, or maybe what they don't know, is that if you're looking at censorship on college campuses, it is an issue. However, it's just not an issue for conservatives. Because even if they're constructing this narrative that suggests that they're the victims when it comes to censorship on college campuses, do you want to know who's actually being censored more frequently? Left-wingers. They are terminated far more frequently for political speech than their conservative counterparts. But yet, they're the victims. And simultaneously, they're the true defenders of free speech. I mean, we are actually living in George Orwell's dystopian future. Where... Facts don't matter at all. They no, have no bearing whatsoever in political discourse anymore. War is peace and freedom is slavery. Except the problem with citing Orwell is that they've appropriated that on the right as well. And if you don't buy into their alternate reality, then you're actually the one who's getting duped. I mean, the world has been flipped upside down. And they don't realize what these right-wingers are doing. They're taking this issue of SJWs on college campuses. And they're trying to convince you that this is the source of the polarization, of censorship, of all the issues that we have in the country. Meanwhile, they're not talking about actual threats to freedom of speech. Nobody on the right came to the defense of a teacher who refused to sign an anti-BDS pledge and was then fired. Who on the right called out Donald Trump when he said that you should be penalized for burning the flag? So you've got to understand that this is nothing more than a grift. These people don't actually have a core ideology. It's why people like Candace Owens and Dave Rubin were left wing not too long ago. This is a grift. The money's on the right. It's on the right and everyone can see it. It's why H.A. Goodman, for example, flipped and went from being a Bernie supporter and jumped to the opposite side of the spectrum and is now a Donald Trump supporter. It's because he knows the views are better, the clicks are better, you get more recognition from the right. Because think about this, like, how often do you see Diamond and Silk and these right-wing former YouTubers on Fox News? All the time. They actually have a career on the left Nobody ever brings on me to talk on MSNBC. Nobody talks to Kyle Kalinske that often. He was invited on Fox News twice. In fact, it's a shock that Cenk Uygur has been on CNN a couple of times over the past couple of months. It's genuinely shocking to see that. Because on the right, they elevate people. There's money there to be made. You can get a sponsorship by a right-wing billionaire if you try to prop up the status quo and say what they want you to say. But on the left... That's not necessarily the case. These people don't care about anything but money and popularity. They don't care about politics. Politics is just a vessel that allows them to monetize what they're doing. That's it. It's as simple as that. And Benjamin Dixon does a phenomenal job at laying out why this is the case and why people shouldn't just not take her seriously, but they shouldn't even engage with her. Because by putting her on the same level as other intellectuals on the left, we're legitimizing her and making it seem as if she actually has insight and an intellectual interest in conversing with us. When all this is about is name recognition and money. It's that simple. She's a fraud. These right-wing YouTubers, they all know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Don't fall for it. So I think that anyone who watches this podcast is politically astute enough to realize that what we're seeing now is Donald Trump's administration build a case 
for intervention with Iran. It's incredibly transparent what they're doing, and this isn't surprising, because even if Donald Trump campaigned as a non-interventionist, when you stack your administration with neoconservatives, what do you think is going to happen? When you put Mike Pompeo and John Bolton in positions of power, what do you think they're going to advocate for? What do you think they're going to push for? So it's not surprising what they're doing, and people who have been following these regime change war hawks know exactly what to look for. And this time it's no different. And it's not even like Donald Trump and his administration is trying to be persuasive because they're just using the same exact playbook that George W. Bush's administration used when they were building the case for war with Iraq. And this all started because Donald Trump withdrew from the Iran deal. He then reimposed sanctions on Iran, which explicitly violated the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, and what did that do? That demonstrated to the world that the United States' word is good for nothing. You know, we, we form a treaty with you, doesn't matter, because we might violate it if we get a new president. So that set a horrible precedent, and as Donald Trump elevated warmongers within his administration, like John Bolton, who vocalized his desire to literally overthrow Iran by 2018, well, what happened? We started to see more and more escalations and now we're in a situation where Iran is being blamed for attacks on oil tankers and the United States government is declassifying videos that supposedly prove Iran's culpability. The problem, however, is that other countries like Germany and even Japan are casting doubt on this claim. In fact, the owner of the Japanese tanker itself claims that something hit the ship, but it wasn't explosives. But regardless, even if this intelligence and the quote-unquote evidence that has been presented is dubious at best. Well, Mike Pompeo pretty much is saying, well, they say that, but we're still insisting that Iran is culpable. So you should definitely believe me, because why would we ever lie to you? Wink, wink. President Trump says flatly that Iran was responsible for the attack on those two tankers, and the Pentagon has released this video which appears to show a Revolutionary Guard crew removing an unexploded mine from the hull of one of the boats. But as Rich reported, Germany's foreign minister says the video is not enough, and the Japanese owner of one of the ships says that he believes from the crew that it was hit by a flying object, not a mine. Uh, two questions. How certain are you that Iran was responsible for these attacks, and do you have more evidence that you can share with us? Well, Chris, it's unmistakable what happened here. These were attacks by the Islamic Republic of Iran on commercial shipping on the freedom of navigation with a clear intent uh, to deny transit through the strait. This was on the Gulf of Oman side of the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, there's no doubt. The intelligence community has uh, lots of data, lots of evidence. The, uh, the world will come to see much of it, uh, but the American people should rest assured we have high confidence with respect to who conducted these attacks as well as a half a dozen other attacks throughout the world over the past 40 days. Now, I absolutely doubt the legitimacy of what he's saying. But here's the thing. We don't even have to try to disprove what he's saying. Let's assume for a moment, hypothetically speaking, that Iran was in fact culpable. Does that mean that the U.S. would be justified in further escalation? Absolutely not. If Iran was in fact culpable, that would be more reason for us to be the grown-ups and de-escalate. Get them to come back to the table and negotiate with us, even if they have reason to not want to negotiate, but try to quell what's happening here before it leads to confrontation. So even if they were guilty, which I don't believe they are, but even if they were, that still doesn't give you a reason to invade or further escalate with Iran. But the problem is that as we continue to poke Iran, we are making matters worse and worse, and we're making the likelihood of escalation and all-out war more possible. Because here's what the United States did by withdrawing from the Iran deal. They are empowering hardline extremists within Iran's regime, who are now announcing that they will be enriching uranium past what was allowed under the JCPOA, because I'm assuming that they believe this is the only thing that will deter further U.S. aggression, which, honestly, I mean, if I were Iran, I would think it seemed imminent. Now, a large part of the reason why Donald Trump's administration presumably feels emboldened to keep escalating further and further with Iran is because the mainstream media has been doing a very poor job at framing the situation and informing the public. 
And I know that it sounded like in that clip that I showed you from Fox News with Chris Wallace that he was doing a good job relatively, you know, of holding Mike Pompeo's feet to the fire. The overall takeaway, if you watch that entire clip, was that anything Iran did was bad and anything the United States did was inherently good by definition because we're doing it. So, of course, we're the good guys and everyone else is the bad guys. And it's not just Fox News here because, as Adam Johnson of Fair points out, things are being framed in an incredibly biased way. So, when Iran enriches uranium, they're violating the Iran deal. But when the United States reimposes sanctions, it's because we withdrew from the Iran deal. So whenever they do something that violates it, they're violating it. If we do something, well, we withdrew, so that's fine. This is how a pro-war consensus ends up emerging. It makes it seem like any and every action that the United States takes is justified because Iran is inherently more hostile, but in actuality, we're the ones that are being hostile. We're the ones that are being overly hostile, but it's not framed that way. If you tune into the mainstream media, you'd think, oh, well, Iran obviously is acting irrationally and the United States government is just responding to them. That's not what's happening. We're the aggressors. We're the ones who are imposing harm on them. And think about what we did. We withdrew from the Iran deal and we imposed harsh sanctions to the extent where we are squeezing their economy. And it's not just that, you know, their economy is tanking and the standard of living in Iran is decreasing. What's happening is there are medicine shortages that are happening. We have collapsed their banking system, which makes international suppliers reluctant to give them food because they don't know if they're going to be able to get paid. So, I mean, we're harming them in a really overt and severe way, but yet we're still being portrayed as the good guys who are just responding to Iranian hostility and aggression when the opposite is true. Now, I want to play a clip of Bernie Sanders on MSNBC. He was interviewed by Andrea Mitchell, and he did a phenomenal job at really deconstructing all of these propagandist pro-war talking points that we've been seeing from Donald Trump's administration and that have been reinforced by the mainstream media. And in this very interview, I don't even know if Andrea Mitchell realized that she was doing this, but she was helping to craft this pro-war narrative, this pro-war consensus, because when she talked about this attack that was allegedly the result of Iranian aggression, she said, well, look, you know, um, at least the UK agrees that it was in fact Iran. They didn't even mention that Japan and uh, Germany, they disagree and they're telling us to cool it. But with that being said, I want to show you this clip because Bernie Sanders does a brilliant job here at just dismantling the pro-war propaganda that we are being hit with now, perhaps more so than ever. I want to ask you about Iran because we're seeing increasing tensions. Now a thousand more troops deployed. Secretary Pompeo momentarily is going to be speaking from CENTCOM. Uh, Iran is now threatening to break out of the nuclear deal for the first time after complying for 14 months, <laughs> according to international inspectors, even though the president withdrew from it. So we, we see these hits on the tankers. They say there's intelligence. At least the Brits agree with the U.S. that this was Iranian-based or Iranian-proxied. You know, there could be an accidental war. What do you yes. do if you're the commander-in-chief, Bernie Sanders, you're President Sanders? What do you do right now where Iran is arguably acting Our, aggressively, even if it's whoa, 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 in reaction whoa, whoa, whoa. to the U.S. policy well, first making? Of all, first of all, just a couple of points, Andrea. First of all, what is absolutely necessary is an objective investigation as to these incidents. Uh, the destruction or the bombing or the attacking of uh, oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman is not acceptable and we need to investigate it. Uh, second of all, you don't accept what the secretary, let me just ask, you don't no. accept the declaration no. from the secretary of state? No, I don't. I mean, there needs to be an objective uh, investigation. As you know, the Japanese uh, take, in fact, the owner of the tanker that was attacked right. disagrees with Trump. Uh, but here's the main point that I want to make. If you look at the recent history of this country, uh, I think we understand that the two worst foreign policy disasters uh, were based on lies that came from the White House. Uh, you remember the so-called Gulf of Tonkin incident that led us to increase military involvement in Vietnam. And man, I could speak you know, that was my generation. 59,000 brave young men never came home from that war. 
and tens of thousands of more died, committed suicide, got into drugs when they came home. That was based on a lie. And then you look more recently at the war in Iraq, which I vigorously opposed because I did not believe Cheney and I did not believe John Bolton and I did not believe the Bush administration. Again, based on a lie that Saddam Hussein in Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Let me just say this. I will do everything that I personally can as a United States senator to stop the United States attacking Iran. If we go into a war with Iran, this will be an asymmetrical war which will go on and on and on. There will be never-ending wars in the Middle East. It will make the war in Iraq look like a cakewalk. So we have got to do everything we can to bring the antagonist, Saudi Arabia, which is a brutal dictatorship, together with Iran. Bring them together. Use the power of the United States to work out a diplomatic solution, not a military solution. So that was absolutely fantastic. And I applaud Bernie Sanders for being consistent here. And he said what you always want to say. He said what is absolutely necessary is an objective investigation into these incidents. This is always going to be the first and most proper reaction, because if the U.S. government makes a claim, well, then what do we say? All right, that's fine. Let's have an objective, impartial actor go in and investigate. The United States is not an impartial actor. They have an agenda and they're not acting in good faith and they're working backwards from their conclusion. They want you to think that Iran is guilty so that way you feel as if they're justified in further aggression and hostility towards Iran. So we can't trust that their assessment is actually accurate because they're not objective. They're not impartial actors. Have an NGO or an IGO come in, uh, you know, have the UN conduct an investigation. But the US, if they conduct an investigation, should we take them at their word? Uh, no, because I'm sorry, they've lied to us before. They'll do it again. And Bernie Sanders made this point. He brought up the Gulf of Tonkin, the Iraq war. And the point was, we need to learn our goddamn lesson. The last war that we were lied into, we're still there. We never left. We're currently conducting drone strikes in numerous countries. Pakistan, Somalia, we're giving Saudi Arabia the bombs that they're using to commit genocide in Yemen. When are we going to learn our lesson that what the United States government says isn't always going to be something we should take at face value because they have an agenda. They have an agenda and we have a capitalist war machine that profits off of death and destruction. So it behooves them to constantly have us in these never-ending wars because that's a moneymaker. And the military-industrial complex funds politicians that are more than willing to do their bidding. So Bernie Sanders here is speaking truth to power. He's speaking out against this. And there have been few people that have spoken out. Tulsi Gabbard speaks out about this all the time. And to her credit, Elizabeth Warren has spoken out, even if she hasn't been great. In fact, she's been really horrible on foreign policy issues previously. But we need all hands on deck here. We need every single person to speak out about this. And what we need is someone who is going to be a leader on this issue. And that's what Bernie Sanders essentially said he would do as president. He said we need to bring Saudi Arabia and Iran together and use the power of the United States to work out a diplomatic solution. This is what a leader does. President Donald Trump has officially kicked off his 2020 re-election campaign and expectedly he's doing what he always does whenever there's an election that he needs to win. He's ramping up the anti-immigrant rhetoric and this time it's no different because this is what he's trying to do now presumably to mobilize and excite his base. He announced via Twitter, next week, ICE will begin the process of removing the millions of illegal aliens who have illicitly found their way into the United States. They will be removed as fast as they come in. Now just pause for a moment and think about the implications of this because he's saying that they're going to remove millions, plural. So I'm assuming that he, at a minimum, is aiming to remove at least 2 million undocumented immigrants. Well, according to Pew Research, there's approximately 10.5 million undocumented immigrants currently in the United States. So what he's saying here is he wants to remove a fifth of our entire undocumented immigrant population. Let's just assume he actually does want to do this. Can you just imagine 
what you would need to actually do something like this. I mean, the amount of resources you would need in terms of money would be huge in terms of personnel, in terms of expertise, as well as planning. You would need to put so much into this that you would essentially not be able to focus on anything else. On top of it just being unfeasible, think about this from a moral angle. This will inevitably result in human rights abuses, even more racial profiling, because we all know that if Donald Trump were to ever do something like this, this would be implemented in the most sloppy way possible, and you would need to come up with a real plan, which we all know Donald Trump is incapable of doing. But I mean, even if we know that executing something like this is incredibly unlikely because it's so impractical, still, the implications of this tweet here are troubling because it still tells us that regardless of the scope of this crackdown, there will be another crackdown because he's got an election to win and he knows that if he wants to keep his base excited and loyal, he's got to keep cracking down on immigrants with these draconian fascistic policies. So even if there's another crackdown, this is still bad, even if it's not going to be on that scale. Because what does a crackdown mean? It means that this will cause irreparable harm to vulnerable communities because they're seeking asylum oftentimes due to violence in their country caused by U.S. imperialism. And in case you haven't been paying attention, Donald Trump's administration confirmed that they have more than 13,000 children who are immigrants in U.S. custody, six of which have died in ICE custody, which journalist Ken Klippenstein learned were preventable deaths that occurred due to negligence. And because this is becoming such a big problem, well, what did ICE do? They just stopped updating the official death count. And now, as Jessica Corbett of Common Dreams reports, Earlier last week, Trump administration officials revealed plans to detain migrant children at a former Japanese internment camp in Oklahoma because an influx of minors has overwhelmed shelters throughout the country. I mean, think about this. As Americans, on both sides of the political aisle, we all came together collectively and agreed that what happened during World War II, the way that we imprisoned Japanese Americans... That was a disgusting blemish on our history, one of many, but we agreed that that was bad. And now what we're doing is we're using those internment camps to lock up migrant children. It's like history keeps repeating itself and we can never learn from our mistakes. So this is absolutely outrageous and everyone who has a moral compass should be outraged by this. And in fact, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was outraged by this. And the way that she described this was, these are basically like concentration camps. So she was outraged by this. But the way that conservatives responded to our draconian anti-immigrant policies was to be outraged at the way others vocalized their disgust with these types of policies. So here's what AOC said that sparked so much outrage. The United States is running concentration camps on our southern border. And that is exactly what they are. They are concentration camps. And um, if that doesn't bother you, I don't, I got I like, we can have, okay, whatever. I wanna talk to the people that are concerned enough with humanity to say that we should not that never again means something. So what she said was not just accurate, but it was incredibly reasonable. It was a perfectly rational response to have to the sight of migrant children being detained. I mean, we purport to be the freest country in the world, and we are locking migrant children in cages. There are 13,000 children who are detained currently in ICE custody in harsh conditions, according to some reports. And... When people vocalize outrage, well, some individuals, Liz Cheney, for example, are outraged at the outrage. So Liz Cheney tweeted, please, AOC, do us all a favor and spend just a few minutes learning some actual history. Six million Jews were exterminated in the Holocaust. You demean their memory and disgrace yourself with comments like this. Now, AOC responded saying, hey, Representative Cheney, 
since you're so eager to quote unquote educate me, I'm curious. What do you call building mass camps of people being detained without a trial? How would you dress up DHS's mass separation of thousands of children at the border from their parents? And she then added, and for the shrieking Republicans who don't know the difference, Concentration camps are not the same as death camps. Concentration camps are considered by experts as the mass detention of civilians without trial. And that's exactly what this administration is doing. And she's exactly right. But this is exactly what Republicans do. They don't get outraged ever at the source of immorality. They get outraged at the way people describe the injustice. They get outraged and police the language of people who are reacting to what is happening. This is what they always do because it serves as an easy way to start distracting people. So we're no longer talking about migrant children in cages. We're talking about the semantics as to how we should describe migrant children being detained by ICE. And it's because Republicans and conservatives, generally speaking, they don't care about immorality. These are not moral people. Liz Cheney's father is a mass murderer who should spend the rest of his life in prison. But of course, you know, the true bad guys are the people like AOC who denounce these types of fascistic immigration policies and human rights abuses. They're the bad guys because they didn't describe this injustice appropriately, according to people like Liz Cheney. Here's the thing, regardless if Donald Trump is able to execute this type of crackdown or not, we should all be outraged at this. We're locking children in cages. 13,000 migrant children are being detained. And people are more outraged at the outrage. The state of American politics is so toxic, so amoral currently, that if we don't come together and agree on a real objective standard of morality, because I don't believe in moral relativism, but if we don't agree on a standard of morality, if we all craft our own standards of what is and isn't moral, then I don't know how we could ever come together as a country. Because anyone who dismisses the treatment of migrant children by Trump's administration, there's someone that I can never work with. I can never work with these people. So it's a sad state of American affairs where whenever there is actually outrage for the way that we're detaining migrant children, well, the people who speak out get told to shut up or they get language policed for not talking about it in a way that conservatives deem appropriate. It's sickening. Everybody knows that Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, is the richest man on the planet. He is worth $154.8 billion. But we don't ever really stop to think about just how large a sum of money that really is in actuality. Like, let's just picture for a moment that we were going to spend some of that money and buy things that rich people buy. So, of course, the first thing you'd want to purchase is a mansion. Well, how much does a mansion cost? They start usually at around $8 million if you want to purchase a mansion in Los Angeles. But let's say you want to purchase a really luxurious mansion and you spend $100 million and, you know, you wanted to splurge a little bit, so you bought two of them. Let's also say that, you know, if you wanted to spend this money, you wanted to buy a couple of cars, a couple of Lambos, and you spent about $10 million on cars. You then went on to buy a yacht, which costs, you know, $45 million if you're getting a really nice one. And then you spent $10 million on a private jet and another 400000 for maintenance each year. So if you're Jeff Bezos and you just spent all of that money, how much of a dent would that make? in your overall net worth? Barely any. The point is that even if he tried to spend this money in the most reckless way possible, he would never be able to spend all of that money. He's 55 years old, so he's not going to be able to spend all of that by the end of his life. And in the event, he were really, really lucky and he lived to be a thousand years old. He still would be unable to spend all of that money money. So that's the point. It's such a gigantic sum of wealth that it's difficult to even fathom how much money that is because you can go on a spending spree and purchase mansions and private jets and yachts and cars and still not even make a debt 
in your overall net worth. Meanwhile, his employees work so hard that they are forced to pee in bottles to save time. Or they'll urinate in trash cans to save time. They'll be shamed to work oftentimes, even if they're injured and shouldn't work. Amazon workers also experience mental breakdowns, usually as a result of harsh working conditions. And they're barely even paid enough to survive. I mean, do you think that's fair? Do you really think it's justifiable to have the CEO of a company make so much money that he can't even spend all of that in 10 lifetimes, let alone one? while his employees are working in such harsh conditions that they're having mental breakdowns and they're peeing in bottles in order to remain as productive as possible. That's not justifiable. He's exploiting them. He is exploiting them. And Amazon, they absolutely don't like when you point this out. They don't like when you draw attention to their exploitative practices. But this is wrong and we should point it out because this is a form of theft. This is wage theft. He's exploiting their labor and not sufficiently sharing the benefits of what they produced for him. And then when people criticize them, they panic and freak out. For example, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she basically made the same exact points that I just made. However, when she made this point, since she actually has a real power in politics, well, they panicked and they felt compelled to respond immediately. So as Bess Levin of Vanity Fair reports, when Amazon announced in February that it would not be opening a second headquarters in Queens as previously announced, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was one of the first lawmakers to claim victory, tweeting that defeating Amazon's corporate greed, its worker exploitation, and the power of the richest man in the world was proof that anything is possible. And four months later, it appears her feelings about the company haven't changed. Speaking to ABC's This this week on Sunday, AOC asserted that the only way Jeff Bezos was able to become the richest man in the world with a net worth of $117 billion after giving his ex-wife roughly $37 billion was by treating his employees like slave laborers, noting that she has no issue with Bezos being obscenely rich if Amazon is paying its workers a living wage, AOC added. If that's the case, and Jeff Bezos is still a billionaire, that's one thing, but if Bezos' wealth is predicated on paying people starvation wages and stripping them of their ability to access healthcare, that's a major problem, and you'll never believe it, but the tech giant did not take kindly to such comments. These allegations are absurd, Amazon said in a statement. Amazon Associates receive industry-leading pay starting at $15 an hour. Amazon prepays 95% of continuing education tuition costs through its career choice program for associates who want to pursue in-demand careers. Jay Carney, Amazon's head of communications, later chimed in to say, more than 42% of all working Americans earn less than the $15 an hour Amazon pays entry-level fulfillment center employees, and all our employees get top-tier benefits. I'd urge AOC to focus on raising the federal minimum wage instead of making stuff up about Amazon. On. Last October, after the tech giant raised its minimum wage, Bloomberg reported that the company had eliminated stock awards and monthly bonuses for warehouse workers and other hourly employees. So do you understand what they're doing? They desperately, whenever they're criticized, try to get the person who's criticizing them to shut up because they don't want you to realize what they're actually doing and how they're treating and exploiting, frankly, their workers. Don't look at us. Look at all the other large multinational corporations who aren't paying their workers a $15 living wage. At least we're doing that, and that's great. But let's remember that you actually didn't opt to pay your workers a $15 an hour living wage until you were shamed into doing that by Bernie Sanders. You didn't do that on your own accord. You did it because you wanted people to stop looking at you and to divert their attention elsewhere. But let's also be realistic here. A $15 minimum wage, that may be better than other large multinational corporations, but it's absolutely nothing to write home about because let's face it, if you live in New York City, if you live in Seattle, $15 isn't enough to survive. It's still not a living wage. It's not, I'm sorry, it's not. People are gonna call me an extremist for pointing that out, but let's be realistic here. It's a $15 minimum wage because it's a minimum. Ideally, 
you pay workers more than $15. Because if you live in New York City, how are you going to survive off of $15 an hour? Like, it's absurd that the federal minimum wage isn't just $15 an hour already. But even if we raise it to $15 an hour, that's still not a livable wage. And as time passes, as Congress doesn't act and raise the federal minimum wage, $15, well, that's not as valuable as it was five years ago when the fight for 15 began. So these companies, they do the bare minimum and then expect praise from you while they're still exploiting their workers, treating them unfairly, not addressing the mental breakdowns that are happening in Amazon warehouses across the country. It's absolutely maddening. And it's important that people like AOC call out Amazon for what they're doing here because this is exploitative and they absolutely should not be allowed to exploit their workers. And Jeff Bezos should never be allowed to amass that much money if his workers can barely survive. What Amazon has been doing is they're taking advantage of a capitalistic system that is ruthless. The laws need to be changed. Nobody should be able to amass more than a billion dollars in wealth, one, because they don't need it, and two, because you're never going to work that much harder than your employees to where that much money is justified. Because it's not. So long as there is income and wealth inequality, so long as there is homelessness, so long as people have food insecurity in the United States, nobody in this country should be allowed to amass that much money. What do we do then? We tax them. We take that money because that's not their money. That's the money that they stole from their employees. And by taxing that, we're just taking it back and we're giving it back to employees because they like to denounce taxes as theft, but the real theft is them stealing that money and exploiting the labor of their workers in the first place. So Amazon can cry all they want. They can try to respond to AOC and claim that she's lying, but they're only responding because they know they're in the wrong and they have to try to make sure that they divert attention away from them. And it's true. There are other large multinational corporations that are probably treating their workers a lot worse. But that doesn't mean that we can't also focus on Amazon. And when you have a CEO that is the richest man in the world, I'm sorry, you're just going to end up attracting a lot of attention. Bernie Sanders is taking a lot of flack for tweeting out what some perceive to be an attack on Elizabeth Warren. And I'll be honest, I don't personally think that this tweet is controversial at all. With that being said, though, I do want to proceed cautiously here because... The people who were outraged over this weren't the usual bad faith actors who are trying to go out of their way to interpret whatever Bernie Sanders says in the most negative way possible. Like there were some people on our side, allies who support Bernie Sanders, who also said, look, I don't think this is a good look for Bernie Sanders and I don't think he is proceeding about this in the right way. Now, to be fair, I think that Bernie Sanders should have been more clear here, but I think that what's missing here and why some people, even supporters of Sanders, took issue with this is because there's a lot of context that's missing here. So, to talk about what started this all was a tweet from Politico where they shared an article and added the caption, centrists are coming around to Elizabeth Warren as an alternative to Bernie Sanders. Now, the article is about how Wall Street backed third way Democrats are starting to warm to Warren, not necessarily because they agree with her politically, but because they kind of view her as a more palatable alternative to Bernie Sanders. And they view her as the lesser of evils if someone is going to win who is progressive, because it looks like there's a lot of left-wing momentum currently. So they kind of see someone who's on the left as inevitable if Joe Biden isn't able to pull it off. So what it seems like the article is communicating here is that third way is saying, all right, if we've got to go with anyone... Warren is the better progressive if our arms will be twisted here. Now, here's why they say they prefer Warren to Sanders. One is a democratic capitalist narrative, said Matt Bennett, a co-founder of Third Way, a centrist think tank that convened a conference of party insiders in South Carolina this week designed to warn about the risks of a nominee whose views are out of the political mainstream. The other is a socialist narrative. 
So in other words, if we have got a pick between someone, I guess we could strategically get behind Warren because at least she's still a self-proclaimed capitalist, whereas Bernie Sanders is a self-avowed socialist, and we just can't back that. They also argue that they don't think Bernie Sanders would be electable against Donald Trump specifically, specifically because of that socialist label. Now, additionally, here's what they also say in this article about centrist support for Warren. It's a sign of how the ideological lanes of the 2020 primary have blurred and overlapped and of the steady progress Warren is making as a candidate. But it's also a statement on Bernie Sanders, Warren's top rival for progressive votes. Sanders continues to face significant resistance from within the party and nowhere more so than among the moderates and establishment players who blanch at his talk of democratic socialism. Establishment and moderate Democrats haven't necessarily been won over to Warren's camp yet. Many still point to the former vice president, Joe Biden, as their preferred candidate, but the tensions that once marked Warren's relationship with moderate Democrats have begun to dissipate as she methodically lays out her agenda and shows a folksier, more accessible side that wasn't always apparent in her role as a blue state senator and progressive icon. So they're saying, all right, since Warren is surging and she may be our best bet to defeat Bernie, She's the lesser of those two evils, and we'd rather back her than Bernie. That's kind of what I saw here, but there's a couple of takeaways from this article. First of all, if you are even remotely palatable to the Wall Street-backed third-way Democratic wing, then you're just not radical enough for me. You're just not radical enough for me, and I think it's because they realize that even if Elizabeth Warren is substantially you know, to the left of someone like Joe Biden— the comparison between her and Bernie Sanders is still meaningful because Bernie wants to fundamentally change the system, whereas Elizabeth Warren, even though she does want to make some drastic changes, she still wants to work within the parameters of capitalism and won't do too much to upset the establishment and overturn the apple cart, so to speak. So in response to this article, in response to the reality that third-way Democrats feel more comfortable, unsurprisingly, with Warren then Bernie Sanders, this is what he said. The cat is out of the bag. The corporate wing of the Democratic Party is publicly, quote, anybody but Bernie. They know our progressive agenda of Medicare for all, breaking up big banks, taking on drug companies, and raising wages is the real threat to the billionaire class. Now, what happened is immediately after he tweeted this out, people took offense to this because they thought that, oh, well, Bernie Sanders now... He's even lumping Elizabeth Warren in with the corporate wing of the Democratic Party, specifically because he tweeted out this article that was very heavily about Warren. But in actuality, it was really more about Bernie Sanders in the sense that third way is just detailing who is a bigger threat to them. And it's obviously Bernie, hence why they're opting for Warren, or they're trying to get more comfortable with the idea of Warren becoming the nominee. But even people who are on our side who support Bernie pointed out that they weren't too happy here. So this is what Walid Shahib tweeted out. If we had a multi-party parliament, it'd be pretty normal for Sanders and Warren to campaign against each other for leadership in a social democratic party. That said, I still find this move pretty disappointing and unnecessary. Draw contrasts if you want, but not like this. No, I think that the reason why Walid Shahid, who was an ally to progressives, instinctively kind of came out against Bernie here is because, you know, he misread what Bernie was trying to say. What Bernie was trying to say wasn't necessarily something about Elizabeth Warren. His tweet was only tangentially about Warren. He was saying that Third Way views me as a threat, and they literally would opt for anyone over me, including another lefty like Elizabeth Warren. That's what Bernie Sanders was saying. And as this was explained more thoroughly to Walid Shahid, he kind of came around. So, for example, a New York Times journalist gave him some more perspective here and explained that at a third-way conference that he just attended last week, they were literally talking about how Warren is more palatable because she's not as far to the left 
as Bernie because she's moving away from Medicare for all, which is a relief to them because let's remember these third way corporate Democrats have a lot of health industry donors. So if Elizabeth Warren will preserve that system, then obviously that's going to be more preferable to them. And Walid Shahid even pointed out after that that, you know, Elizabeth Warren's stance on Medicare for all is in fact inferior to Bernie's and even inferior to Kamala's, believe it or not. So what Bernie was ultimately speaking to here was the threat level. That's it. You know, I get that he should have been more clear. And I think he knows that he should have been more clear because after he put out this tweet, his team clarified almost immediately. So as Tina Wynn of Vanity Fair reports, as Sanders' tweet began to make the rounds, his campaign rushed to clarify that it had been aimed not at Warren, but at centrist Democrats like Third Way, whose executive vice president of public affairs, Matt Bennett, declared last October that he would support any Democrat nominee with the exception of Senator Sanders. We're open to everybody except for him. So it wasn't an attack on Warren. With that being said, Bernie Sanders has to be extra cautious in the way he words things. Because at this point, he's got to realize that there are so many bad faith actors who want to bring him down that they're going to look for reasons to attack him. So he's got to make sure that if he's going to say something like this and respond to an article that heavily references Elizabeth Warren, he should do so in a way that makes it seem as if, you know, he's not referencing her, he's referencing third way Democrats. Now, I'm sure he thought that he made that clear, but you've got to go a step further to make sure that, you know, um, you're squeaky clean because there's so many bad faith actors that want to smear Bernie Sanders as someone who's an aggressive Bernie bro, who's trying to go after someone who is progressive. And if, you know, Elizabeth Warren is too much of a corporate Democrat for Bernie, then, you know, who isn't a corporate Democrat? The only person who's not a corporate Democrat is Bernie, in his view. That's essentially what they're going to try to do. That's kind of what we saw. So Bernie does need to, not to pick on Bernie, but he does need to try to be more clear here and word things more clearly and try to not step on the landmines that are being set for him. That being said, I thought it was obvious that he wasn't referencing Warren and trying to attack Warren or besmirch her character and call her a corporate Democrat. But with that being said, I think the fact that allies, people on our side, took it that way means he should have probably been a little bit more clear. But, you know, there were, of course, bad faith actors that did try to capitalize on the situation. And there's a lot of people who support Bernie Sanders, like myself, who instinctively defended him here because we know what he was trying to say and we know the establishment and third way corporate Democrats are against him. So we came to his defense. Now, because we defended him, because Bernie supporters defended him, other people who are bad faith actors decided to chime in. For example, multi-millionaire Chrissy Teigen said that as a result of Bernie Sanders supporters defending him here, quote, Bernie supporters will be the downfall of Bernie. I don't even hate him, but you guys are absolutely insufferable. Do him a favor and stop being so combative against Democratic criticism. Now, I don't know much about Chrissy Teigen's politics. I don't even know if she's genuinely on the left. I know she's anti-Trump, but I mean, she, in 2011, advocated for a Republican. I don't know if that was a tacit endorsement of Mitt Romney, but I don't even know if she realizes why people are so passionately supporting and defending Bernie Sanders. But I pointed this out to her. And my response to that was, Bernie supporters know he's the only candidate that wants to fundamentally change the system that's killing them. So hopefully you can understand why peasants often vocally defend him against bad faith attacks. Looking forward to taking your wealth, Chrissy Teigen. Now, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I often like to tell celebrities that piss me off that I want to take their wealth, because I do. Um, because I hate capitalism, and I hate that it allows these rich assholes to rich explain to us peasants and tell them, you're being insufferable for defending a candidate who's always prone to these bad faith attacks by the establishment. It's just infuriating. But going forward, I do hope that Bernie Sanders is a little bit more careful. Even if I knew what he was talking about here and what he was referencing here, I think that he gave his haters enough ammunition to where they could potentially 
you know, remove the context from the situation or misread what he's trying to say and view this as an attack, you know, against Elizabeth Warren. And even if they know that maybe he's not necessarily trying to attack Elizabeth Warren, the mainstream media has a vested interest in getting him and Elizabeth Warren to exchange blows because that's what's going to generate views and clicks. But I don't think that Bernie and Warren should be taking shots at each other during the primary. Um, if it comes down to a race between just him and her, then I think it's perfectly reasonable for them to really draw these comparisons because they really are different, right? They're different on a number of issues. Elizabeth Warren is horrible when it comes to foreign policy, for the most part. Elizabeth Warren is terrible when it comes to healthcare because she is wishy-washy on Medicare for all. However, I think Bernie needs to be more clear, and I think that... As his supporters, we have to try to listen to our allies because even if people, you know, took issue with this, try to understand, like, from the perspective of someone like Walid Shaheed, I don't think he's a bad faith actor. So I think that we should try to explain to them why Bernie Sanders said this and give him more context because what this is about is something that we all know about and have seen over the years, that the establishment is out to get Bernie Sanders. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's a fact because if you go against moneyed interests and the powers that be, you're going to make yourself a target. FDR was a target, right? So Bernie Sanders knows that he's a target. He knows that with him doing what he's doing, advocating for, you know, a fundamental change to the system, he's going to make himself a target. We know that as well. We just have to try to engage with allies rather than shooting them down. And I think that Stedman on Twitter did that with Waleed and really explained to him where Bernie Sanders was coming from. In case you haven't noticed, Joe Biden is finally starting to slide in the polls, thank God. And the reason why he's sliding, and the reason why just overall he hasn't had the best week, week and a half, is because he can't stop putting his foot in his mouth. Again, and again, and again, he says or does something that's either wrong or so bizarre that you can't help but not like him. And this is precisely why he's starting to slip, and it's what we all predicted in indie media would happen. Now, let me give you a couple of examples to demonstrate what I mean here. So, when a pro-choice activist asked him about his wishy-washiness with regard to the Hyde Amendment, he condescendingly then proceeded to wag his finger in her face and said, nobody has spoken about it, done more, or changed more than I have. The lie detector test determined that was a lie. Oh my God! He then told a room of 100 elites in New York that they don't have to really worry too much about their taxes being raised because Joe Biden isn't about wanting to demonize people who make money. In fact, they really don't have to worry about his tax policy being too burdensome. He then reached out to a Trump-supporting billionaire Republican Party donor for money and then was subsequently rejected. <laughs> <laughs> but on top of all of that, he just dropped this gem on us. So as Isaac Stanley Becker of the Washington Post reports, Joe Biden wistfully recalled on Tuesday an era in which he was able to get along with segregationist senators even when they didn't agree on much of anything, dismissing criticism from his party's left-wing flank that he is too conciliatory toward political adversaries, the former vice president told a crowd of about 100 people gathered for a fundraiser at the Carlisle Hotel in New York that one of his strengths was bringing people together. He knew this made him old-fashioned in the eyes of restive Democrats, he said, but he remained adamant that political fellowship of the sort he maintained with white supremacists in the 90s 1970s was not just possible in today's climate, but the best answer to the forces elevating President Trump. Quote, if we can't reach a consensus in our system, what happens? Biden said at the fundraiser, according to a poll report. So understand the context that he is talking about when it comes to bipartisanship. His view of bipartisanship is so broad that he literally believes that people of color should come together and work with white supremacists, literal white supremacists, self-proclaimed white supremacists. That's his view of bipartisanship. The problem, Joe, is how do you bring people together who are diametrically opposed? How do you have the audacity to ask black Americans and people of color in general to work with people who are opposed to them, who deny their humanity? Are you seriously asking them or telling them that that's what they need to do right now? I mean, think of how privileged you sound. 
No, we don't need to work with white supremacists. What we need to do is defeat them. There absolutely needs to be a rainbow coalition where we bring together working class voters, but we don't need to include white supremacists and alt-right assholes in that category. They need to be defeated. They need to lose. That's the only way that we can go forward. And if you don't realize that, Joe, then you're even more out of touch than I previously thought. But he's not done here because this article is going to talk about how he goes on to discuss white supremacists who he worked with, including James Eastland and Herman Talmadge. Now, Herman Talmadge, for those of you who don't know, was a vocal opponent to the civil rights movement. He was also in favor of segregation. And when it comes to James Eastwood, he was arguably even worse, if you could even imagine, because during World War II, he was so opposed to black soldiers serving in the military and fighting the Nazis that he actually did his own Hitler-esque speech where he denounced black soldiers and said that they can't possibly participate or they shouldn't participate because he claimed that they were physically and mentally incapable of serving. He was also unsurprisingly opposed to the Civil Rights Act and the Civil Rights Movement, claimed that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was unconstitutional. He was against Brown v. Board of Education. I mean... The list goes on. These are bad people. Very bad people. And if you're talking about these people, or you knew these people, then you should never bring up their names unless you talk about how you challenged them and shamed them for their disgusting, dehumanizing, racist beliefs. That's not what Joe Biden does here. Quote, I was in a caucus with James Eastland, Biden said, at the fundraiser, where he was introduced by Eric Meinditch, an investment manager and former Goldman Sachs partner. The Democratic presidential candidate, who has led his competitors in early polls of the crowded nominating contest, briefly imitated the southern drawl of the Mississippi cotton planter, lawyer, and lawmaker. He never called me boy, Biden said. He always called me son. Biden's campaign didn't immediately return a request for comment about why it would be notable that the Dixiecrat who thought black Americans belonged to an inferior race and warned that integration would cause the quote mongrelization didn't call Biden boy, a racial epithet deployed against black men. He pressed his case at the fundraiser Tuesday, using the examples of Eastland and Talmadge to argue that gaping differences can be accommodated. He said he could work with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell without being best buddies because he knows how to demonstrate respect for Republicans. Even with Talmadge, one of the meanest guys I ever knew, Biden noted, at least there was some civility. We got things done. We we didn't agree on much of anything. We got things done. That sort of pragmatism, he suggested, was rooted in personal affability, and he lamented its demise in today's bitter partisan warfare. But today, you look at the other side, and you're the enemy, Biden said. Not the opposition, the enemy. We don't talk to each other anymore. Maybe it's because one side has gone completely off the rails, Joe. The Republican Party is so extreme that they are literally not just blocking progress that we've made towards tackling climate change, but they are undoing whatever progress that we've made. They're literally facilitating the demise of humanity. So forgive us for not wanting to talk to them or work with them. And he talks about here, oh, well, you know, James Eastland, he never called me boy. He called me son. I mean, what a tone-deaf statement. Of course he didn't call you that, Joe, because you're white. He doesn't think you're inferior. He doesn't view you as someone who isn't equal to him. The reason why he called black men boys was because he thinks that they are an inferior race. So for him to say, oh, well, he was respectful to me because he called me son and didn't call me boy. I mean, I'm baffled. I'm baffled that he would actually say something like this. What a fucking moron. Now, because his comments were so stupid, this led to almost universal condemnation, even from his Democratic Party rivals. Cory Booker called on him to apologize for the comments. Bernie Sanders also agreed that he should apologize. Kamala Harris said that the comments he made deeply concern her. Even John Delaney made a tweet denouncing Joe Biden. 
If John Delaney thinks that you've gone too far to the right, you've gone a little bit too far to the right, Joe. Now, in case you disagree with him, which most people on the left do, well, here's what he has to say for you. If you don't want to work with the other side, this is his response. We have to work together. The fact of the matter is if we can't get a consensus, nothing happens except the abuse of power by the executive. Zero. I want to make it clear to Republicans that you understand on some things there is a rationale for compromise. And so, folks, look, if you start off with the notion there's nothing you can do, well, might you all go home then, man? Or let's start a real physical revolution if you're talking about it. So that was a clip taken from his appearance at the Poor People's Campaign. Just the way that he talks to people. Like, I'm not a fan of Joy Reid, but I felt cringe for her at the way he was talking to her. That was just weird. Joe Biden, he can't win. Because if he wins, this dingbat is going to end up losing to Donald Trump. So if you are a Democratic Party voter and you're supporting him... Think seriously about your decision. So we've got a follow up on the story uh, that we talked about yesterday regarding Joe Biden. And for those of you that missed that video, I would encourage you to watch it. But if you didn't see that video, then let me just give you a quick rundown. So basically, Joe Biden drew criticism from his Democratic Party rivals because what he did was he talked about the need for bipartisanship and working together. And to do that, he talked about how he used to work with white supremacists, like actual segregationists like James Eastland. And he went a step further. He then went on to humanize them and talk about how he was such a nice guy and he called me son and not boy. I wonder why he called you a white person's son, Joe. So basically, the reason why a lot of people took issue with this is because there was this underlying implication that he was saying that people of color should come to the table and work with these assholes who dehumanize them. And by trying to humanize horrible people like James Eastland, you're doing a disservice to people of color because these assholes like James Eastland, they would have never allowed for people who they dehumanize to be humanized and viewed in the way that Joe Biden is allowing us to view them. They think that black people are inferior. Like James Eastland literally gave a speech during World War II to complain about how he didn't like that black troops were serving. He said that they were mentally and physically incapable of serving in the military. So Joe Biden demonstrated how racially insensitive he is. You don't get a pass because you were the VP for the first black president. Sorry, you don't get a pass. So a lot of people criticized him. And what Cory Booker did, one of his rivals, was he said Joe Biden should apologize. So Joe Biden was asked about Cory Booker saying he should apologize. Watch his response here. You don't have to like the people in terms of their views, but you just simply make the case and you beat them. You beat them without changing the system. How does it feel that your Democratic rivals are implicitly saying that you have issues talking about race? They know better. Are you going to are apologize? Like Cory Booker apologize for, for what? Cory Booker's called for it. Cory should you. apologize. He knows better. There's not a racist bone in my body. I've been involved in civil rights my whole career. Period. 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 He was genuinely shocked. You could see it on his face. Apologize for what? Why should I have to apologize? I only talked about how lovely these white supremacists were and tried to humanize these bad people that would never give the people they dehumanize the time of day to be viewed as, you know, a human being. But I don't see why I should apologize. And his answer to Cory Booker, it's unreal. It blew my mind. Uh, Mr. Biden... Cory Booker says that you should apologize. What do you say to Cory Booker? His response? No, you. Wow, this is a child. This is a child. This is the left-wing Donald Trump. He's maybe slightly more intelligent than Donald Trump. He's certainly um, almost as narcissistic as Donald Trump. And he says things that... He can't fathom why people would take offense to them or disagree with him. It's all about me. Me, me, me. 
What? I have to apologize? Why would you do this to me? Why would you say that I should apologize? No, you should apologize to me, Corey, for saying that I should apologize. Drop out. Just drop out, Joe. Drop out. The fact that anyone even thought about supporting him, I mean, he's sliding in the polls now, but the fact that anybody thought about supporting him, it shows <laughs> the power of, you know, going away, right? Because everybody was okay with Joe Biden when he was gone, and they had these nostalgic views of him during the Obama era, and then he comes back, and they're reminded what a fucking dipshit he is. What a moron. He needs to just drop out. We need to move on. We don't need to go backwards to Joe Biden and the Obama era. I get that you still may feel these warm and fuzzy feelings. People just, they reminisce about the good old days when we had a Democrat in the White House. But they don't realize that the reason why we got Donald Trump was because during the Obama era, they were ignoring a lot of issues that was leading to desperation that caused the radicalization that ultimately facilitated the rise of someone like Donald Trump who exploited that desperation that people were feeling. So we don't need to go back. And we certainly don't need to look to Joe Biden. If we can't do better than Joe Biden, then I don't know what to say. The Democrats are just um, useless. And to nobody's surprise, Nancy Pelosi defended him. The supposedly woke leader of the Democratic Party defended him. If Democrats can't even be good on social issues, which is basically their only strength, then go the fuck home. You have no business being in politics. Because the one thing that really differentiates Democrats from Republicans is them being at least reasonable on most social issues. They still need to do better, right? They need to improve substantially, but they're better than Republicans. But if you can't even give us the bare minimum, if you can't understand why we don't want you to humanize these white supremacists, if you can't understand why we're not going to negotiate when it comes to issues like abortion and the Hyde Amendment, go the fuck home. We don't need you. We don't want you. Drop out, Joe. Just a couple of days ago, we talked about how the situation between the United States and Iran is getting incredibly, incredibly terrifying. And just days later, tensions have already escalated even further because today, Iran shot down a U.S. drone because they claim that this violated Iranian airspace. Now, predictably, the United States is uh, denying that it went into Iranian airspace and they're maintaining that it was an in international airspace. Now, regardless of who you believe or whether or not you think that they were justified in shooting down this drone, regardless of whether or not, you know, maybe they just temporarily entered Iranian airspace and then left it, I don't care. This should not be a reason for war, period. And I'm sorry, but I don't believe the United States. Is it plausible that they did in fact violate Iranian airspace? Absolutely. In fact, I'd say that it's likely, even if we don't necessarily have the evidence to determine that that was the case. It's their word against Iran's word, but I do know that there are warmongers in Donald Trump's administration that are currently trying to do whatever they possibly can to goad us into war. And even if, let's say, the United States is telling the truth and they didn't cross into Iranian airspace, Flying that close to Iran, I mean, what are you trying to do? You're trying to intimidate them. This is what we do all the time. We perform these military exercises just outside of North Korea's border because we're escalating, we're intimidating them. So this is what we do all the time. We try to give countries a reason to act aggressively so we have a justified reason to invade them. That's what we see again and again. So I really hope that people don't fall for it because we're seeing history repeat itself. And what we all are now worrying about is whether or not the United States government will use this as quote unquote evidence that Iran attacked us and give them what they wanted in terms of taking action militarily. Now, the head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, Hossein Salami, stated that Iran, quote, does not want war with any country, but we are completely and totally ready and prepared for war. So again, when you say things like this, you're just stoking the flames here. Everyone needs to calm down because war wouldn't benefit anyone. But, you know, unfortunately, 
we don't have people in positions of power around the world that are rational, right? We have Donald Trump, a gigantic man-baby who's belligerent, who is making decisions on our behalf. And then in Iran, well, when Donald Trump pulled out of the Iran deal, what he did was he emboldened all of the right-wing extremists in Iran. The moderates were essentially delegitimized by Donald Trump's decision because, and Kyle Kalinske, to his credit, lays this out in a recent video. You know, they were saying, you don't want to work with the U.S. because they can't be trusted, and the moderates pushed for a deal. And then, unfortunately, Donald Trump proved them right by withdrawing from the JCPOA. So here's what happened. Donald Trump issued this tacit threat to Iran via Twitter. Quote, Iran made a very big mistake. Now, in an interview with press, he reiterated this same sentiment, except he said something else that was very chilling. How will you okay. respond, Mr. President? How will you respond? You'll find out. You You'll find out. You'll find out. I mean, obviously, 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 you know, we're not going to be talking too much about it. You're going to find out. They made a very big mistake. He was asked, are you willing to go to war with Iran? His answer was, you'll find out. And he later said they made a very big mistake. That sent chills down the back of my neck. And it's not like we can really take anything that Donald Trump says with, you know, anything more than a grain of salt, because this is an incoherent babbling buffoon. So, you know, you don't really want to focus on certain words too much, because oftentimes what he says is empty and meaningless. But with that being said, it's still really startling to see a U.S. president say you'll find out when it comes to war rather than just shooting down, you know, that prospect. Now, if you're wondering why he's sounding more and more hawkish and is moving away from his non-interventionist st stance here and not just unequivocally denouncing this idea that war with Iran is possible, well, it's because guess who's steering the ship? John Bolton. So as the Washington Post reports, administration officials interviewed by the Washington Post said that the national security advisor, John Bolton, has dominated Iran policy, keeping a tight rein on information that gets to the president and sharply reducing meetings in which top officials gather in the White House's situation room to discuss the policy. On Monday, the Pentagon said it would send an additional 1,000 troops to the Middle East, another step to beef up the U.S. posture in the region. The reinforcements come as the administration's, quote, maximum pressure campaign, spearheaded by Bolton and Pompeo, undermines the Iranian economy. That campaign, initiated after Trump pulled out of the nuclear accord with Tehran, was recently expanded to include the designation of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist group and steps to starve Iran of oil revenues. Think about that. John Bolton is dominating Iran policy. I'm going to play the same clip that I've played on the show before. This is what he said in, I believe, 2016 or 2017, about Iran. And that's why before 2019, we here will celebrate in Tehran. Thank you very much. So him and Mike Pompeo, they're the ones that are goading Trump into war. And they know that Donald Trump instinctively may be against this idea that war with Iran is a necessary thing. But they also know that Donald Trump is incredibly stupid. So they're exploiting his stupidity to get what they want. Now, one senator, Angus King, actually made a really poignant point, And he said that what it seems like they're trying to do is box Trump in so he feels like he has no choice but to strike Iran because they know that he doesn't necessarily want to do that. But at the same time, if they make it seem as if he has to do that, then of course he's going to act because he's not bright enough to realize that he's being duped by these neocons. So this is a horrifying situation. Um, not something that I want to see. Um, but regardless, we'll keep watching this. I genuinely hope that we see a concerted effort by the Democratic Party, by libertarians in the Republican Party. Rand Paul, I hope everyone speaks out and denounces this at the top of their lungs because this is officially time to freak out. If we don't de-escalate, then war with Iran is possible. And if that were to happen, it would be absolutely devastating. As many people like Bernie Sanders say, it would make the war in Iraq look like a cakewalk. 
don't want to see that happen. So we all need to, need to do our best to spread the word and get others, our peers, involved and aware that we may need to take to the streets, if not already, to protest war with Iran or even further escalation. Let's talk about this piece from the New York Times. I find this incredibly fascinating. So what they did was they sat down all 21 Democratic Party presidential contenders and they asked each of them the same questions. There are 18 questions in total. And I think this is incredibly fascinating. Some of these questions are great. However, not all of the questions are (laughs) as substantive as I'd like. So for example, um, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? don't give a shit, couldn't care less. Like if you are getting each of the presidential candidates in a room and you're going to ask them these questions, why would that be one of the questions you ask? But with that being said, I don't want to gripe too much because I think overall this is fascinating. Now, keep in mind that I haven't actually watched these videos ahead of time. So you're seeing my genuine first time reaction, although I do kind of have an idea as to how some of these candidates performed based on the reactions I saw on Twitter. So I know that I'm going to be disappointed when it comes to Israel. I know I'm going to be disappointed when it comes to healthcare. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, I sound like Philip DeFranco. Sup, sup, sup. And let's just jump into it. But um, <laughs> so what they do for each of these questions, you click on it and it'll give you a summary of their answers. But if you want more context, if you want to know more about their statement here, you can watch each of the candidates individual videos. Um, I don't think we're going to get to all of these because I don't want this to be a super long video, but let's just go ahead and um, we'll start with healthcare because that's something that's incredibly important to me. On healthcare, would you be focused on improving Obamacare or on replacing it with a single payer system? Yes. Both of them. Yes. I think both. I don't see in any way that those two are mutually exclusive. I don't think we have to accept um, that false choice. My focus would be building on the Affordable Care Act. My focus would be building off of the Affordable Care Act. Same talking would be point. on improving the Affordable Care Act. Same talking would point. Be on improving Same the Affordable talking Care Act. We can begin by improving the Affordable Care Act, but we have to go far beyond that. My focus would be Uh, on replacing it with Medicare for all. I believe in Medicare for all. I support Medicare for all. I think the wisest thing for us to do is to have a Medicare for all type plan as a public option. No, a coverage for all system. Universal coverage. Universal health care in the United States. We need to move to a universal health care system. I think we need to move towards single payer. We need to move towards a single payer system. I want to make sure that Medicare is there for everybody in this country. I believe in a Medicare for all single payer program. Um, okay, lots to say there. First of all, Elizabeth Warren expectedly disappointed me. Well, would you prefer to focus on improving the Affordable Care Act or uh, replacing it? Yes. So do you understand how weak and just bizarre that answer is? Elizabeth Warren, what is your plan for health care? Yes. That's not an answer, Warren. I mean, Jesus Christ, just for once in your life, have a spine and take a stand on something. I mean, each and every single week, she's proposing these phenomenal policies, but on healthcare, for whatever reason, she's weak. She's weaker than Kirsten Gillibrand. She's weaker than Kamala Harris. How, of all people, you'd expect Elizabeth Warren to be the one to come out on top and say, look, I'm standing with Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard. We've got to move to Medicare for all immediately but she's not doing that so that's disappointing i expected her to disappoint me there um a couple things i want to touch on so when they say would your focus be on improving the affordable care act they said that basically verbatim like four candidates said it and even if the question was worded that way understand that this is a talking point by the democratic party establishment how many town halls have we seen where they're asked if they support medicare for all and they immediately jump to well i think we should improve the affordable care act Okay, but that's not really a clear-cut answer. How do you want to improve it? Um, there's, couple, there's a couple of people towards the end, like, uh, what's his name? Jay Inslee, for example, who said, we need to move towards a universal healthcare system. Now, 10 years ago, I would have assumed that that meant they support single payer, where healthcare is free at the point of service. But nowadays, 
when a Democrat uses the word single payer, or excuse me, when they use the word universal health care, that doesn't necessarily mean that they support single payer. That just could mean, well, you know, I support universal health care in the sense that I want to expand the Affordable Care Act so it covers like 100% of people. That's what it uh, could mean. So that doesn't mean single payer. Now, the one that I think I found the most egregious was Marianne Williamson's answer because she was obviously trying to do double speak. Oh, well, I support Medicare for all as a public option. <laughs> do you support Medicare for all? Or a public option. Those are two different policies. Which one is it? You can't have it both ways. Either you support a public option or Medicare for all. Now, you can support a public option. That's fine. I disagree with you. But if you're going to be disingenuous and say Medicare for all because you know that that's what we want to hear, when you support a public option in actuality, I find that maddening. So public option or Medicare for all. You don't get to sit on the fence here, Marianne Williamson. Pick a side. Now, the one that surprised me, honestly, was Andrew Yang, because when I had him on my show, I asked him this very question because he's been waffling back and forth between a public option and Medicare for all. And here he said very clearly, um, Medicare for all. So, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris, they had the right sense to say, I don't think we should, you know, um, be forced to choose between what is a false dichotomy. But I really want them to explicitly say Medicare for all. Um, but overall, I think that this was disappointing. I love how Beto here, he says, oh, well, I think we have to start by improving the Affordable Care Act, and then we just go beyond that. But you can just jump straight to Medicare for all. And then um, you improve <laughs> health care for everyone. It's like they're clinging to the Affordable Care Act specifically because... This is something that the last president who was a Democrat did, and they just want to preserve his legacy. I don't care about Obama's legacy. What I care about is health care, and they should too. So um, I'm not surprised by Bernie Sanders' stance. Of course, he's strong here. What I want to get to is the people who um, we've been following on this issue. Kamala Harris, for the most part, has been strong. Um, she kind of reversed course when it comes to whether or not she'd get rid of public health insurance or private health insurers. But let's hear what she has to say here. Well, I don't think we have to accept um, that false choice. I mean, let's first agree that the Affordable Care Act took us to a place where tens of millions of people Just get to for the, the first time had access to health care. And it was revolutionary, frankly, um, no, what they were able to achieve in terms of improving and, and reforming the health care system. I think we now need to take it to the next step because still in our country so many people do not have access to affordable health care. Um, my goal and I think the best place that we could be is, is to have Medicare for all and um, I support Medicare for all. Um, and you know the other part of it is that we have to have policies in our country that recognize that one of the biggest barriers, in fact the biggest barrier to everyone having access to, to health care is cost. Okay. And that's, um, we that's good have for me. got to be focused she gave on the right answer. reducing in, in some situations. Okay, John Delaney is going to be disappointing. Let's hear from Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, I support Medicare for all. I think the current system that we have continues to be broken, even with the advances made in the Affordable Care Act. There are still far too many people in this country who are uninsured or who are underinsured and ultimately are not able to get the care that they need. Good. Short, but sweet. That's exactly what I want to hear. I think the wisest thing for us to do is to have a Medicare for all type plan as a public option and then to give people the opportunity also to keep their private insurance. Oh, if I they hate want. this. This is probably the worst because she's being so disingenuous. Like she's clearly trying to have it both ways. I hate these types of answers. Just tell me if you're for or against something. Don't try to gaslight me. I believe in Medicare for all because Good. I think health care is a right and not a privilege. And one of the challenges we've had with the ACA is we never got to universal coverage that was affordable. So I think the best way to do that is through Medicare for all and ultimately having a single payer that is an earned benefit, just like uh, Social Security today. Good. Where everyone buys in at a price they can afford, matched by their employer, right. and you buy in your whole life. Okay, the buy-in gave me public option vibes. But for the most part, it was good up until that point. But I mean, she's co-sponsoring Bernie Sanders' bill. Hopefully, you know, um, <laughs> she means what she says. But Kamala did better in that regard, as did Tulsi Gabbard. Let's hear from Warren. Yes. 
Yes. Look, and in fact, I I'd be answer. focused on three things. The first is we need to defend the Affordable Care Act. No, we don't. We could just go straight to Medicare for All. It. Lawsuit down in Texas. HHS is doing everything they can to take the legs out this of This is a long, Second meandering we answer. Do, uh, we need to pick off the things that are easy, reduce the cost of prescription You don't drugs. have to take this I've step. Got a you bill can do to reduce all of this with Medicare for All. Drugs. Why uh, waste energy and political capital when you could just jump straight to the right insurance, policy? Private insurance so that people don't private get ripped insurance. off. Uh, same kind of deal I set up for credit credit card companies. That's part two. And part three, we got to keep moving us to a place where everybody is covered at the lowest possible cost. Nope. And nope. there are a lot of different ways to get there. Medicare nope. for all has a lot of different paths. Nope. For no, it doesn't. Medicare for all has one path. You pass it. Boom, you're done. It's that simple. Hate this answer from Elizabeth Warren. I mean, You'd expect better from someone who's a self-proclaimed progressive, but that's a terrible answer. That's a corporate Democrat-esque answer. Let's hear from Pete because he has been against Medicare for all. Um, he says, I think we need to move towards single payer. Oh, here it is. The proof is in the uh, that, uh, full answer here. I think we need to move towards single payer. And the way I've proposed to do it is a kind of Medicare for all who want it. Uh, so he supports public option. See, you have to really go beyond just that basic face level rhetoric because there's so much disingenuity here that they're trying to mislead you because they really know how much we want Medicare for all and they want to tell you what we want to hear. But they don't want to say it in a direct way because they know that that'll piss off progressives. So they do it in this roundabout, sneaky way saying, well, you know, I support Medicare. They emphasize that word for all who want it. You know, it, it's so frustrating. Um, let's go to Andrew Yang. My focus would be uh, on replacing it with Medicare for All, uh, a system that provides health care to all Americans. Uh, I think that the Affordable Care Act was a tremendous step forward, but did not go quite far enough. Okay, that's good. It seems like he is coming back around to Medicare for All. It still gives me pause because um, he's waffled on it before, but I mean, this is a step in the right direction. I'm not going to bother watching Bernie's because Bernie hit it out of the park. He does this every time. He's the best on this. Um, okay. Next, we will go to, do you think Israel meets international standards of human rights? This is a really easy answer. It's no, it should be no across the board, but I have this <laughs> sinking feeling that they're all going to fuck this up. Come on. Do you think Israel meets international standards of human rights? I have great concerns about the role that Netanyahu is playing. You know, I think... Nope. I do. I do? <laughs> yes. Yes. Overall, yes. <laughs> I think Israel often does, uh, but not always. When you're addressing the issues around Israel, one has to look at their evolution. I believe that we can get back to kind of policies that affirm that two-state solution, affirm human rights. I do think that, by and large, um, Israel meets the standards of human rights. What a I joke. believe Israel does work to uh, ensure what a human rights. Joke. I think there's more that could be done. Oh, I, I believe that uh, Israel like a lot of other that countries. That side at the beginning um, told you everything. He's going to try to bullshit wants you. Wants to do the right thing. Israel they want to do the right thing, but they're not. needs to work with the Palestinian people to find a two-state solution. Work with the Palestinian there people. There are some challenges with Israel. Oh, come um, on, that, that Tulsi. You're the foreign policy candidate. enormous challenges. Oh, fuck off. And they are our strong ally. Uh, we need a liberal democracy in that region. Come on. with that liberal democracy. I know that Israel attempts to meet no, they don't. They're brazenly rights. violating um, human rights. I know that they could do a better job. Well, I think they could do a better job. I think that you all think? countries can improve uh, in all respects. I think that there are many countries, including the United States, that behaves in ways that do not always meet international standards of human rights. Um, certainly so some of the actions Israel? that are being taken there are, are deeply problematic. I think uh, Israel's human rights record is problematic and moving in the wrong direction. So they all fucked this question up royally. I guess the best, I use the word best very loosely, was Pete Buttigieg. But it's funny, he answers this question 
still shittily, but better than everyone else. But this week, um, we got word that he would not move the embassy back. So, I mean, this is all around. Each and every single one of them shit the bed, including our favorites, Bernie, Tulsi, Warren. This isn't hard. It's a yes or no answer. And objectively speaking, according to human rights watchdogs, the answer is no. You don't need to go, you know, on this long tangent and give us this long-winded response. Just be concise. Um, no. So Kamala's wrong here. Um, let's see. Basically, everyone was wrong. Let's go to Elizabeth Warren. I think that Israel is in a really tough neighborhood. I understand that. This they is bad. face enormous challenges. What about the Palestinians? And they are our strong ally. We need a liberal democracy in that region and to work with that liberal Are they a liberal democracy, democracy if Palestinians but it is who also live in Israel case are second-class citizens? But encourage Liz? our ally the way we would any good friend to come to the table with the Palestinians and to work toward this a permanent so solution. I strongly support a two-state solution, and I believe that a good friend says – to the Palestinians really and to the being Israelis, careful with her words here. come to the Wants table to and negotiate. The, the United States cannot dictate the terms of a long-term settlement with the Palestinians and the Israelis. But what it can do is urge both of them to go there and to stay out of the way, to let them negotiate the pieces that are most important to them for a lasting peace. Um, the current I've heard enough. This is not adequate. Let's hear Bernie. I have great concerns about the role that Netanyahu is playing uh, in Israel uh, and their relationship uh, with the Palestinians. Uh, as I've said many times, uh, I believe 100 percent in the right for Israel uh, not only to exist, but to you exist to in that. peace and security. Of course, everybody just accepts uh, but that. But the role of the United States is to work with all of the entities in the region, including the Palestinians and to do that in an even-handed way. That was such a milk toast, weak, weak answer, Bernie. I mean, even the best progressive in the race can't just even hit anywhere near the target on this. Uh, let's go to Tulsi, because Tulsi, she is the foreign policy candidate. The fact that, you know, she's having a difficult time here is so frustrating. Uh, I think that there are some challenges with Israel um, that, that need to be addressed. Could you expand on that? I think that ongoing issues that we continue to see in the conflict between Israel and Palestine are complicated, uh, but there need to be pro there there needs to be progress made uh, ultimately to make sure that both the Israeli people and the Palestinian people are able to live in peace uh, and securely. Tulsi, it is so obvious that you're avoiding the question and you're sitting on the fence. How are the progressives even fucking this question up? It's an easy question. It's an easy question. You can say, look, if you're afraid to say anything that would, you know, give off the perception that maybe you're anti-Israel, you can say, look, I believe in Israel. However, I go by what the international organizations are, are saying. I go by what the UN says. And it's obvious that they're in violation of international law. They are violating international standards of human rights. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. That's what international organizations are saying. This is easy, but progressives can't even get it right. They're all fucking it up. So, so disappointing. Every single one of them. Um, I'm good. I don't want to hear anything else because it's just going to piss me off. They're all bad. Every single one of them. That was, um, they all get an F. Sorry. They all get an F. <sighs> wow. Okay. So <laughs> that really pissed me off. Do you think President Trump has committed crimes in office? Let's go with this one because I think, again, this is another easy one. Just objectively speaking, he violated campaign finance laws. He's in violation of the emoluments clause. Ten different acts of obstruction of justice, according to the Mueller report, should be easy. You think 
Do you think President Trump has committed crimes in office? I believe this president, uh, Mr. Trump, believes himself to be above the law. It looks to me like President Trump's committed crimes in office. I do. I think he's violated the emoluments clause. Oh, I don't think there's any question that he obstructed justice. I don't know. I, I would love to see the Mueller report, and maybe we can talk about it after that. I think it is likely that Donald Trump Did they has film this committed before crimes the in office. Report? Yes, I do. I think he may well have. Perhaps that could be true, and I think Congress is continuing its oversight duties. What Mueller did not opine on is whether or not there was obstruction of justice uh, and was unwilling to reach a conclusion. I'd like to see the full report. Does it seem to me that there's a very, very good case for the obstruction of justice? Absolutely. Does it seem to me that there's a very, very good case for other crimes as well, uh, certainly uh, for, for indictment? A absolutely. Certainly there's a lot of uh, evidence and uh, discussion that, that, that he might have. I can't say he that, you know, I haven't seen the, either the full Mueller report or others that crimes per se. I think it's very likely that President Trump has sealed indictments waiting for him. I don't think it's my job to determine whether he committed crimes. I think it's Congress's job. There's evidence oh, that the president on. has directed people to lie to Congress. I believe President Trump has committed crimes while in office. I think that if you read the Mueller report um, and with any objective eye, it is deeply disturbing and alarming. I don't know how anybody reads the 448 pages of the Mueller report and arrives at any conclusion other than we need to start impeachment proceedings against Donald Trump. I believe the president has committed impeachable offenses, and I think there needs to be a, a congressional investigation to draw out the facts. The Mueller report was not the end of the story. It uh, is really just part of the beginning. So I think Elizabeth Warren was probably the strongest here, although I'm a little bit confused as to the timeline here um, because it seems like they all recorded at different periods of time. So clearly Kamala Harris recorded this when uh, they hadn't seen the full Mueller report, but Elizabeth Warren did. So, I mean, I think we should kind of give Kamala the benefit of the doubt, but I think that anyone who doesn't at least say, you know, oh, well, he's certainly in violation of the Emoluments Clause. That's obvious because he didn't put his businesses in a blind trust. I mean, if you can't at a minimum say that and you're riding the fence here, then I find your answer disappointing. Okay, so let's see. What else do we want to click on here? Does anyone deserve a billion dollars? This is easy. No, they do not. Let's see what they say. Do you think anyone deserves to have a billion dollars? I mean, if they earn it. How do you earn a billion, court? Kamala? Sure. sure. This is America. Sure. If you earn it uh, fairly. Sure. Sure. Nope. Yes, there are people who deserve to have a billion dollars. Who? No, no one deserves to have a billion dollars. I don't know that anyone deserves Kirsten to have got it. a billion dollars. Deserves got nothing to do with it. I don't think anybody deserves to have a billion dollars. There are people that are lucky to have a billion dollars. Like, do I think that there's something intrinsically wrong with there being billionaires in the world? No, I do not. What troubles nope. me is the fact that the federal government so often favors the wealthy over working people. I got a lot of problem with billionaires who are not paying a fair share. Yeah, I mean, oh, I, that I, was a fence sitting know. answer. I, that's a <laughs> high class luxury. I think they should certainly pay more in taxes. Is there not some obligation that they should help? Uh, create opportunity or enhance the opportunity for others. I'm not sure anybody cosmically or morally deserves to have a billion dollars, but I don't hold it against them. Mm. You should. I think that people deserve to work hard and make money. That How does nice our country make sure answer. that there's Maybe. shared prosperity? If they worked hard. Uh, How do you work hard enough to get a billion? That's the point. You can't work hard enough to get a billion. Our system. Ah, oh, they're is so out frustrating. Right to me, the real question is: Do we deserve to live in a country where half of the population can't afford five hundred dollars? I think that we make a mistake <laughs> in this country when we uh, confuse dodges. wealth with worth. We need a tax system which demands that the wealthiest people in this country countries start paying their fair share of taxes. And my guess is when you have that, you're not going to have too many billionaires left. Okay. Bernie and Warren dodged the question. Tulsi Gabbard, at least she answered it. Her answer was completely wrong. The answer is no, because you can't possibly earn a billion dollars. And quite frankly, you don't need more than a couple million. So in my ideal society, we have a marginal tax rate of 100%, anything above $5 million per year. You don't need more than that. I'm sorry. Um, and maybe that's a little bit too harsh in some people's views. But um, until we start actually really 
reducing wealth and income inequality and solving the homelessness crisis and uh, uh, poverty in America. We need those funds more than these millionaires need that. Let me go to Tulsi's answer because I feel like there is more than a one word answer. There had to be. Look, those those who uh, who work and and earn uh, money in this country is is not a bad thing. It's how they do that and what they do with it. I think matters. I think the fact that we have had such an imbalance in our country with uh, vast income inequality, where our laws benefit the very few, making it easy for the richest to get even richer, while the middle class and the poor continue to struggle, is what's wrong, and that's what we need to fix. So she basically said the same thing that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren said. Oh, well, you know, it's not necessarily billionaires, but it's, you know, them not paying their fair share. Um, no, billionaires are the problem. Nobody can earn that much wealth. Um, let's see here. Describe the last time you were embarrassed. I don't care about that. Um, let's see. What do we want to click on? I don't want this video to be too long. It's already getting pretty long. Would there be American troops in Afghanistan at the end of your first term? This is a good one. Would there be American troops in Afghanistan at the end of your first term? No. 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 Uh, there would not. There would not. Uh, I suspect not. There will not be American troops in Afghanistan at the end of my first term. Not in any sizable number. Well, I'd, I'd have to look at uh, the circumstances, but it'd probably be you know, very nope. limited. If there were troops there, there'd be very few. Nope. If there were, they'd be there with a clear mission Wrong to answer. prevent uh, terror attacks, and that's it. If there is a responsible way for us to get our troops out of Afghanistan in that time frame, there would not be any troops Horrible left. Horrible answer, Andrew. The nope. ideal, of course, would be to remove all U.S. troops. But, but even if we could get a more stable situation that would allow for fewer troops to be there, uh, that would be a huge step forward. Uh, I will seek to pull out uh, American troops from Afghanistan who are not there uh, to train and equip or provide uh, security uh, at our embassy. As president of the United States, I would make no move in Afghanistan until first I spoke to Afghan women. So I'm like most what? Americans, I want to get our troops out of Afghanistan. I um, believe we should bring back our troops from Afghanistan. No, we need to bring our American troops home. Uh, we cannot have forever wars in this nation. So most of them got that right. The answer is um, we bring the troops home. Um, let me see what Marianne Williamson said, because her answer didn't make sense. So there's got to be more context here that it makes As it make sense. As president of the United States, I would make no move in Afghanistan until first I spoke to Afghan women. I want to hear from the Afghani women. I'm very aware of the history of the Taliban in relationship to women. And so nothing happens until first I talk to them. See, this is an answer that gives me pause because here's the thing. There are human rights atrocities going on everywhere around the world. The government in Myanmar is carrying out a genocide against the Rohingya. There are numerous human rights violations in Sudan. So what I think she's missing here is that she still believes that there's a such thing as a humanitarian war. She is fundamentally misunderstanding why we're there. We're not there because we care about human rights. We're there because we want the, the uh, minerals that are in Afghanistan. So her, her heart is in the right place. With that being said, I don't think she is understanding why we intervene in the first place. And that worries me. Because as president, she could be misled by generals that, oh, well, there's this human rights violation here. Let's invade. There's this human rights violation here. Let's invade. Um, and I don't like that. So um, I'm not impressed with Marianne Williamson um, in these talks here. Let's see. Do you support or oppose the death penalty? Um, this is an easy answer. It's cruel and unusual punishment. And um, they shouldn't support this. Do you support or oppose the death penalty? I oppose the death penalty, and I have long held that view. I'm personally opposed to the death penalty. I always have been. I've, I've always, always opposed, opposed the death penalty. The death penalty. I, oppose the death penalty. I, oppose I oppose the death penalty. penalty. I oppose the death penalty. I oppose the death penalty. I oppose the death penalty. I support it in limited circumstances. Okay, so um, that was a bad answer. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, this is actually pretty encouraging. I wish that Joe Biden was included in this. Um, 
I'm realizing now because he's so forgettable that he's not here. Because I would like to hear his um, his responses to some of these. Um, okay. I think I'm going to do one more. And um, we'll call it quits here because this is getting super long. Let's see. Do you think immigration is a major problem in the United States? Um, it's between that and should tech giants like Facebook, Amazon, and Google be broken up? Which one do I choose? Um, because I can already kind of predict what they're going to say about illegal immigration. Um, they're going to give a standard, you know, answer. Maybe we'll do both. So let's see what they say about tech giants, because I hope the answer is to break them up. Should tech giants like Facebook, Amazon, and Google be broken up? The answer in general is yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, I have no problem with the idea of breaking some of these companies up. Perhaps in some instances, we must have far stronger regulations. No. But I do think the Weak. antitrust division at the Department of Justice uh, could be, uh, you know, better used. I think we need but to look at breaking them up. They may well be giants. broken up. I don't think we need to break them up right Weak. now, but we've got to regulate them more effectively. Significantly increase the regulation of them. They need far more oversight and accountability and regulation. These tech giants need to be regulated to protect our privacy. We have to address the size and the power and the concentration of power that now exists, it's not healthy for our country. I think the FTC needs to be empowered to prevent and in some cases reverse the mergers of some of these uh, companies, not just in tech, but uh, across the American economy. Uh, the, my first priority is going to be that, that we ensure that privacy is something that is intact. I think it sh we should act absolutely examine whether they should be broken up. But we have processes in place to, to examine that and, and, and look at it, just as Teddy Roosevelt did, just as Franklin Roosevelt did. The temptation, though, is to Teddy say Roosevelt break them up, which is frankly a 20th century solution to a 21st just, just century set of problems. No answer. I think tech giants first ought to have a lot more obligations. I worry about any presidential candidates making broad brush determinations. Oh, do you now? Because running for president means you're going to have to make some uh, pretty substantial decisions and come out with really bold policies. But we all know that uh, Cory Booker is uh, he's spineless. All right, let's do the immigration one. And we'll end on a positive note with one of the stupid questions, I guess. I don't think it's a major. Do you think illegal immigration is a major problem for the U.S.? I think we have challenges with uh, undocumented uh, immigrants in our country, and, and a lot of those challenges is by forcing them into the shadows. Illegal immigration is an issue, and Democrats have to admit that it's something that we have to confront. Republicans have to be honest about the facts, that we need immigrants, that we're a country of immigrants, that we've Very got to give a pathway of citizenship here. to dreamers and others. I want to help the dreamers. We want to encourage new streams of talent into America. Undocumented immigrants need a path to citizenship I think even the languaging of illegal immigration is a That's problem a in the United States. Yeah. Uh, I do it's not think illegal immigration is a major problem in the United States. I don't think it's a major problem, but Why I do you think we going need down? to this is fix our broken immigration system. I think it's a broken system. Our broken immigration system is a major problem in this country. I think it is a problem. Uh, it is certainly not the kind of problem that Donald Trump makes it out to be. It's not as much of a problem in a in a country right now where we have... 3.8% unemployment. But that being said, we need a system where everyone plays by the rules. I think we have in this country an immigration crisis that's self-created. I think the big problem in the United States. The major problem for the United States is that we need to pass. Comprehensive, comprehensive immigration reform. Comprehensive immigration reform. I think that we have done nothing about immigration for so long. Um, this and just we keeps haven't scrolling done down. enough to figure out a smart way I don't get it. It to just bring people down. that are in our country to citizenships. We have over 12 million undocumented immigrants here in America, and that is a major problem, yes. No, that's a bad answer, Andrew. immigration is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to rewrite our laws. We need to be doing more when it comes to immigration reform. I think the biggest problem we've got right now starts down in Central America. Uh, the United States has withdrawn a lot of support in Central America. It's a destabilized government. Gangs have taken over. And people are forced to flee for their lives. And as a consequence, they end up at the American border, um, whether that's what they really wanted to do or not. Illegal uh, immigration is an issue that this administration has drummed up to cause fear and paranoia. Let me go to Andrew Yang's answer, because that was like 
really bad. If you're saying that the people who are here now who are paying taxes and contributing to our economy, if you think that that's a problem, then that's very Trumpian. So we have over 12 million people who are here in this country that are undocumented, uh, that we know of. I mean, it could be an, an even larger number. Uh, and we should not pretend that it is possible to somehow deport 12 million people. It would collapse should. regional economies okay, and would separate that. families. It's essentially a non-starter. Um, so right now, the status quo is we don't know who everyone is, and then uh, we have problems with that. Um, and many of these people will show up in our emergency rooms or um, get into car accidents or other things where not knowing who they are is uh, immensely problematic. And many of them are operating in an informal uh, shadow economy where we um, aren't having them integrated into the greater whole. And so I'm for a long-term path to citizenship for people who are in here and undocumented. We need to create a path forward for people to see that they have a future here in this country. And this is particularly true because many of them have kids who have known no other life but America. And it would be, again, completely inhumane to separate families on that level. So that was a little bit more thoughtful. I don't like the long-term path to citizenship because they're already here. Like, what are we waiting for? Um, I don't like the path towards citizenship top talk. I mean, just give them citizenship. Give them amnesty. Like, I hate how everything has to be incrementalist. And it can't be bold. We have to make sure that we take the least offensive answer on everything. It drives me nuts. So, um, okay. Now I know why they included some of these really just <laughs> anodyne, like, stupid questions because after you see the rest of the responses you're going to be disappointed and i know that they probably planned these before they got the answers but they're here for a reason because um yeah these were pretty disappointing um do i want to look at the court packing plan this video is already pretty long so um i kind of want to end i keep saying we're gonna end let me look at the court pa packing uh one really quick and then we'll end on uh, a stupid question. Are you open to expanding the size of the Supreme Court? I am open Good. to that discussion. Expanding the size of the Supreme Court is something I am thinking about right now. Mm -hmm. It would make total sense to institute a, time, a term limit of 18 years. And it also would make total sense to increase the number of justices on the Supreme Court. I believe we need to reform the Supreme Court, but it's not just about the number of justices. I don't know that expanding the size of the Supreme Court is the best way to address legitimate concerns we have with its objectivity. I'm open to any idea that can make sure a woman's right of choice is protected. I am open to it. I'm open to it. I am open to that. I'm open. I don't think that expanding the size of the Supreme Court solves the problem. I don't believe that expanding the size of the Supreme Court is the answer. I, I am not. I do not think expanding the Supreme Court makes sense. No. 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 Where does that stop? It's a race to the bottom. I'm not convinced that expanding the size of the Supreme Court is going to fix anything. Roosevelt tried that in the 1930s. Didn't work so well. Expanding the size of it, I think, would require a national discussion. You know, I, I would be open to giving Merrick Garland a seat because I think what happened to him was terrible. I think what Mitch McConnell did was unpatriotic and in many ways an attack on the Constitution. Let me see what Tulsi and Bernie said in the uh, expanded answer here um, because I don't like Bernie's answer. I don't. Um, the point of threatening them with the court packing plan was to get them to stop undoing all of the New Deal reforms. Like we call it the Lochner era because the Supreme Court was essentially rogue and he was threatening to pack the courts to scare the shit out of them. So if Bernie isn't looking at that as a strategy, that's super disappointing. I think the Roosevelt tried that in the 1930s, didn't work so well uh, for him. Packing the courts is a great idea when you're in power, not such a great idea when your political opponents are in power. And so, you know, uh, if you uh, go from nine to 13 and go 13 from seven to 17, uh, it never ends, but I, I am open. Uh, to the idea of rotating judges uh, out of the Supreme Court uh, into courts of appeals, for example, to allow them to get a new uh, look at, at, at the real world that is that is out there. But I'm not in favor of packing the courts. Yeah, that's that's not a really um, 
good answer from Bernie, in my opinion. I get what he's saying about, oh, well, you know, if Democrats, when they expand the court, then Republicans will expand the court. Well, once you expand the court, then you try to stop Republicans from doing the same thing. Like, you have to fight dirty and fight fire with fire. They stole a Supreme Court seat from President Obama. So now all bets are off. Civility is gone. Now you just, um, you take back the court if they're going to be just doing the bidding of corporate America and letting capitalism infiltrate in our democracy. Like, something has to be done. So the idea that he's open to, like, rotating them between the circuit courts and whatnot, that's a step in the right direction. But something has to be done. Like, we can't allow the Supreme Court to fuck up the country for a generation. That's just completely unacceptable. Let's go to Tulsi here. Uh, I don't think that expanding the size of the Supreme Court solves the problem that we're facing, where the court has increasingly become a partisan political entity. That's true. Even if you add uh, more numbers to the Supreme Court, you're still not going to solve the problem. How, unfortunately, uh, those who are appointed are largely appointed on partisan reasons, rather than making sure our Supreme Court justices are chosen based on their commitment to upholding our and defending our constitution. Yeah, um, I would have liked to know how you depoliticize the court then. But, you know, um, it's not my number one issue. All right, that's it. I'm not going to do any more. Let me just go ahead and we'll get to a stupid question here. What's your comfort food on the campaign trail? And then we'll end there. So that way we're leaving on at least a somewhat positive note. Unless they fuck this question up too. Then I don't know what to say. What's your comfort food on the campaign trail? When you're a vegan, that means uh, lots of veggies on the go. I try to stay away from it, but vegan cupcakes is, is probably a real threat on the trail. <laughs> Any kind of fast food. I love a good hamburger. I mean, you can't beat a burger for a quick classic American meal. Grilled chicken sandwich from McDonald's, no sauce. Two of them. A baked potato. Italian sausage sandwich at Paskey in Pueblo, Colorado. I think if I've got one go-to, it's like pulled pork. Kind bars are my comfort food. I do have a sweet tooth, and I will look for those little bowls of, you know, M&Ms or mints. It was M&Ms, but I've taken an oath now to lay off of the M&Ms to maintain uh, belt uh, security. Last time out. We did a trip to the West Coast and I gained three pounds in four days. So uh, there's too much comfort food. <laughs> I have no comfort food. The word got out that I like yeah, beef jerky. Do. And so uh, uh, people have been kind enough to uh, uh, give that to me on the road sometimes. I'm an ice cream guy. I don't have a comfort food. I have a comfort drink, which is uh, iced tea. It's really comfort coffee. Um, my favorite coffee is a mocha. Glass of whiskey at the end of the night. <laughs> Probably chips and guacamole. French fries. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good french fry. Or a few. Or many. Or just the whole thing. Now this just made me hungry. So now I'm angry and I'm hungry. Um, but that's it. Let's stop the video. This is like three and a half hours long. Um, you know, I'll link to this down below if you want to check it out yourself. If you want to see the other uh, questions, some of these might be interesting. Like, do you think that it's possible for the next president to stop climate change? Um, I already know what they're going to say, which is why I didn't click it. I think it's possible for us to kind of lead the way and get the rest of the world to come to the table and get us on that trajectory. They're going to say something like that. In an ideal world, would anyone own handguns? They're all going to say yes. So I've, I've got the main questions that I wanted to see answered out of the way. But, you know, I, I like that the New York Times did this. Hopefully they continue to release these because I think these are really helpful and getting to know where the candidates stand on a range of issues. By and large, the ones that were really important... Um, I was super disappointed. Like the Israel Palestine, I hope that they all see this and they reflect because each and every single one of them gave an absolutely atrocious response. Even our favorites, even Bernie, even Tulsi, even Warren, um, even Yang, they need to do better here. But with that being said, uh, this is this is insightful. So I'm glad that they released this. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Joshua Collins running against Denny Heck in the 10th Congressional District of Washington State. Joshua, thank you so much for coming on the program. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. How's it going? Yeah, it's going great. I know that you're a truck driver, so you're traveling the country. Yeah. You're just an ordinary person who's choosing to run for Congress. What made you want to run? Uh, well, a number of things. Um, the biggest thing is just in my district, uh, we are one of the most progressive and safe blue districts in the country. And we have a representative who uh, just 
won't budge on pretty much anything. He's a conservative Democrat and, you know, he won't support Medicare for all ever. He already said he'll never support it. Um, he won't sign on to the Green New Deal. Uh, and just the giant issues that we're facing in this country um, are too important and too uh, and we're in too much of a crisis to have someone who's not going to actually uh, help with any of it. Yeah, we've actually been following Denny Heck for quite some time on the show. Um, back when he was asked at a town hall whether or not he'd support Medicare for all, and he very bluntly said no. So I've kind of yeah. watched this district for a while. I brought on Tambourine Borelli, who ran against him as an independent in 2018, and now we're interviewing you. So I really hope that um, you're successful here because we've all been watching this district and Denny Heck is really one of the worst Democrats. Like, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that. He's extremely conservative. Right. He takes corporate money, and he doesn't represent the people of that district who, as you said, are incredibly progressive. So let me ask you this. There is a lot of candidates running in 2020. What sets you apart from other progressives? What are some key policy issues that you really will go into Congress fighting for guns blazing? Uh, well, some of our biggest uh, policy issues, I mean, I, I guess we have a lot of them because uh, we are pushing the Overton window with almost every issue. Um, when it comes to marijuana, um, you know, we don't just believe in legalizing it. We don't just believe in, you know, expunging the records of people who have been convicted of marijuana offenses. We also believe in paying reparations to people who have spent years or sometimes decades of their lives in prison. Um, and that is so important to us uh, because, you know, this government has stolen lives from people. That is, you know, relationships ruined, people's careers ruined. And that is, you know, trauma that they will never recover from. And I think it is only fair that the government pays for what it has done to these people and their families. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I hadn't thought about that previously. And my, you know, sense of what reparations should be given out has kind of broadened. Like, I'm definitely on board with uh -huh. reparations for American descendants of slavery. I don't know how you feel about yes. that as well. Awesome. I, yeah, I um, I support um, reparations for descendants of slaves and indigenous people, both structural and financial. Um, whatever we can get done, um, I, I support it. That's great. Yeah. So so people like you and also Mike Gravel, to an extent, have broadened my view of, you know, who we should be paying reparations to, you know, be it victims of war, yeah. people who were victims of our drug war. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so let me ask you about these things, because you are basically a very staunch progressive. But let's just go down the line here. I want to put you on the spot and ask you some very specific policy questions. And if you right. can give me a yes, no or a maybe on this, this will kind of give people yeah. really good sense as to what you stand for. So Medicare for all. all right. Yes. And I also believe in erasing all medical debt. That's great. That's really great. Student yeah. loan debt cancellation. Uh, I believe in free college. I believe in uh, giving stipends to students and canceling all student debt every single penny. That's great. Um, how about ranked choice voting? Uh, yes, I support ranked choice voting, um, automatic voter registration, etc. And yeah. what is your stance on legalizing psychedelics? Uh, I support legalizing psychedelics, um, same as uh, you know, many other uh, drugs that we should have legalized for both medical and recreational use. That's that's excellent. Um, how about uh, public financing of every single election across the country? Uh, I support it fully. Um, I, uh, they have a really good system in Seattle, and I think we can copy that in the rest of the country, um, where they give you essentially a voucher where you can, um, you know, give it to whoever politician, whichever politician you want, and they use that and turn it in. They get they get actual funding for it. So that's what I would like to um, reproduce across the country. That's great. That's great. Um, how about? Let's see here. I have a couple of different things, but I have it for Senate and um, House, so I need to make sure I get the right one. Uh, a federal jobs guarantee. Yeah, I support a federal jobs guarantee. And that um, can be a combination of things um, between transitioning uh, people in the military from fighting in wars overseas to actually bringing them home and putting the work to work on our infrastructure and also uh, you know, getting people out and doing the work that is needed in this country to transition to green energy. And uh, you support a Green New Deal. Um, you support reparations yes. for people who um, 
were uh, locked up for marijuana possession and I'm assuming sales. So yeah, this is great. I think that just looking at these types of policies, you really see that you are different than yeah. someone like Danny Heck. You're part of the new wave. You're an AOC type of Democrat. And I think this is really exciting right. for people. But a lot of people currently, they feel, and myself included to an extent, and I'm sure you as well, feel demoralized because it's really difficult to run a campaign against an incumbent Democrat because you are choosing to not take corporate money. So it's a disadvantage that you're accepting, but at the yeah. same time, it's important because you're one remaining principle and two, you're demonstrating to people that you're not going to be beholden to these large multinational corporations. You're right. going to be beholden to the people. So how do you run a successful campaign against someone like Denny Heck, who's backed by the establishment and you know financial interests when you definitely won't be able to raise as much money as him? So strategically, yeah. like what is your plan to beat him? The um, so, of course, we're not going to raise a million and a half dollars. But right. based on what I looked at with uh, the other campaigns is you need about 10 percent to be competitive. Mm -hmm. So our our goal is realistically we can actually raise about three hundred thousand. Um, but if we have a hundred if we have one hundred fifty thousand, I'm pretty sure we will win this. Wow. Um, so we you know, we and, and we are on track to do that. We just uh, announced um, like seven weeks ago and we're at over twenty thousand dollars already and this is completely online this is just people going onto my website and donating we haven't held any fundraisers we haven't sold any merchandise anything like that and we already hit 20 grand um and i'm not a particularly well-connected person so this is all just organic people going to my website and donating which is um you know i think the new model where people uh go straight to you they they hear your message and they want to donate to you um, and if anyone watching does want to donate, it's at joshua2020.com. Um, and you can also sign up to volunteer and get updates as well. Um, as far as our strategy, our strategy is to build a coalition. Um, and that is, uh, you know, as, me as a truck driver, a blue collar worker, I don't have the same perspective as everyone, but I can bring people from other perspectives into the campaign as part of our campaign. And that means having a kitchen cabinet for every, uh, you know, set of issues, whether it's LGBT rights, indigenous issues, indigenous issues, um, you know, disability issues, et cetera. And that is uh, what we are doing and, you know, making sure that everyone's uh, needs are addressed by this campaign, because this isn't about me and who I am. This is about like who I am going to represent. Um, and so far, we've had a lot of success and a lot of it um, goes to me, uh, you know, making a lot of noise on Twitter about these issues. And and that has brought um, the attention of you know people all over the country onto our district, which is very difficult to do. So you know we are um, getting people activated. We're also bringing a lot of young people into the process, people who were too young to even vote when Bernie Sanders ran for president. And you know we are activating people. And um, you know I, the fact that we have uh, well over 300 volunteers signed up already, uh, I think speaks volumes for you know how. Uh, far we can go. Um, you know, we're we're gonna need a, a basically a small army to defeat Dennis Heck, um, and I think we're gonna get there. Yeah, that's impressive. If you have three hundred volunteers, that really is relatively large. Like it doesn't seem large in the grand scheme right. of things when we focus on like presidential campaigns, but for just someone running in a district who is grassroots funded, that really is impressive. So kudos to you. And I think that your Twitter game is helping, honestly, because I've already seen you dunk on Ben Shapiro. Um, you are calling out Democrats. And one thing that I really like is you've been incredibly vocal about the weakness of Democratic Party leadership. I know that you've talked a little mm -hmm. bit about Nancy Pelosi's unwillingness to uh, pursue an impeachment inquiry to Donald Trump. Yes. I find this infuriating. Um, so in the event you were elected, what would you do to help push? I mean, hopefully when you're elected, Trump will already mm -hmm. be out. But how would you just in terms of putting pressure on Democratic Party leadership, how would you get them to do what progressives want if you're also balancing out, you know, committee appointments and you're balancing out, you know, trying not to offend them to the extent where they can marginalize you in Congress. Like, what's the right way that you think you can hold people accountable in power, in leadership and actually get them to listen? I think the most important thing is, first of all, having a large voice online to give myself a way to bypass uh, the media deciding what the narrative is. And that's why I'm putting so much effort into my Twitter account. Um, in it doesn't sound like a, a lot, but in six months, I went from 34 followers to 10,500. And that is just me tweeting and saying my views. 
I think that is an important part, but also uh, just make the entire conversation public. That way there isn't uh, any any doubt on wh where people stand on this. Um, and part of that is bringing up like who doesn't support something and who does on Twitter. But also if, uh, if someone is going to oppose incredibly popular uh, legislation like Medicare for all, for example, I'm going to go in their districts and hold town halls in their district, talk to their voters, let them know this is where your, your representative stands. If they don't like it, then I, I guess, I mean, that's democracy, right? You, if you actually talk to people and let them know where they stand, because th this is like their entire plan is to hide behind key issues where they are good, like LGBT issues, et cetera. Um, and then just completely hide from the media never talk about it or be very vague when they talk about things like Medicare for all, like uh, the Green New Deal, and, and just kind of waffle on it and be weak on it and just hide from it. So I, I think someone like me who has no problem making a lot of noise and actually uh, doing everything in the public arena is what it takes to actually get people to feel at least pressure to support stuff. Because, you know, I, I think these issues that we are facing, you know, climate change, we're facing an extinction level event. This is the actual apocalypse like coming for us and we have politicians who are uh you know too worried about the existence of the fossil fuel in industry and the profits of you know shareholders right and then we also have medicare for all Forty-five thousand people dying every year and they're too worried about the lives of the insurance companies rather than the people dying um and so i think you know it, it's very clear where the people stand on this stuff there's polling um, and it's and it's just obvious on its face that these are good for us. Um, and so that is I, that is my whole plan is just to make everything public and keep everything out in front where people can see it. Um, so we actually bring people into the conversation. And, and uh, yeah, that's that's the whole plan, essentially. Yeah, that actually is a great plan, because I think that if you kind of have your own like mini bully pulpit, then nobody yeah. wants to anger the person with like millions of Twitter followers like AOC even if she's a target of the right wing like you can see that Democrats mm -hmm. when they often take like shots at her it's anonymously in a political article so I think that kind of emulating yeah. that strategy that's a good strategy you know and it is a way to kind of move the needle in your direction and one thing that I find fascinating about candidates like you is that you're bringing in this new perspective you're younger so like people like yeah. you and I like when we're older we will witness possibly the end of you know the habitability of our planet if we don't take action so this is a serious issue right whereas people in congress you know it's mostly older people who don't really have to see the consequences play out i mean we're already seeing the consequences play out but they're not going to see the worst yes. of what climate change has to offer so i think that that is such a crucial thing that you're bringing you know in terms of the, just this perspective and also you know being a blue collar worker talk about you being a truck driver because um, if I'm a truck driver, I mean, I'm, I just wouldn't want to run for Congress in general. So maybe I'm just biased, but like, I feel like you're, you're going to be busy. You're traveling the world. So wanting to run for Congress would be like the last thing on my mind. So what is it about truck driving and being a blue collar worker that made you feel as if this is what you need to do? The biggest thing is France. What happened in France with the yellow vests, mm. um, they we saw what happened when you have a liberal government try to um you know transition to green energy without uh you know inconveniencing the rich and what that did was put the entire burden on the working class and it was specifically in france truck drivers who started um getting in the streets because they were the ones getting screwed over interesting and i don't want to see that happen in this country i don't want to see um you know a liberal government put all of the burden on the backs of truck drivers and welders and nurses and teachers rather than the extremely wealthy people who have most of the wealth in this country um who have profited off of things like uh you know burning fossil fuels um and so that that's my whole purpose is to actually make the point that like if we don't address this and make sure that we are taxing the rich and that we are spending on our people and actually setting things up in a way that benefits the working class people in this country, they're going to do everything they can to put the burden on us. Mm -hmm. And I would like to oppose that. Now, as a truck driver driving all over the country, um, I've been to, all, to 48 states. The other two I uh, can't really get to with a, a truck. <laughs> um, but I've, uh, I, you know, I, 
I see right now automation is coming for us, right? And it's being celebrated like this really great thing. Um, meanwhile, you have truckers, you know, some of, you know, in, ranging anywhere, ranging anywhere from 20 to, uh, you know, 60, 70 years old, right? Out on this road, they have put, you know, years, in some cases, decades of their lives into this industry. They have put their bodies on the line. They have, you know, sacrificed their personal and family relationships to get people's freight uh, across the country. And then you have these companies like Tesla um, coming in and they just want to scoop up the entire industry and say, okay, forget about the truckers. Let's uh, now all of this, all of this money, all of these jobs that were existing, now all of that wealth is going to be funneled straight to Tesla, straight to Uber or whatever company automates the jobs away first. And that is something that I think is just fundamentally unfair. And that is what they want to do with most industries in this country. Um, you know, low level coders, you have, uh, you know, the entire customer service industry um, where, you know, companies are going to replace people with AI. And that just basically leaves millions of people with no plan, mostly high school, uh, high school educated people with no plan, no jobs, no, like no way to go forward. And I think it's important that we have that perspective going to Congress um, so that we don't have the same thing happen that happened with, uh, you know, the industrialization era where, you know, a, a single factory could do the work of, you know, like 10 factories and, you know, people were just left with no options. I think we need to address automation on the scale that it, it is necessary, the same as addressing climate change on the scale that is necessary, the same as addressing, uh, you know, the health in healthcare crisis on the scale that's necessary, the housing crisis, et cetera. Um, and that's, I guess that's my, my perspective as a, a trucker. No, and that's really interesting. Uh, I find that fascinating because automation is something, and particularly like with respect to truck driving, you know, this is an industry that could be automated away 10, 15 years. Um, so let me ask you this, in terms of dealing with something like automation, what type of approach would you favor, just broadly speaking? So, I mean, there's there's the universal basic income approach where, you know, once these jobs go away, we do UBI. Now, there's various ways you can implement UBI. You can do a UBI in lieu of social safety net programs, which I don't support, or you can do a UBI Same. in addition to social safety net programs. Or do you kind of agree with this more democratic socialist model where, you know, if automation is going to be the future, which it seems like that will be the case, we should be reaping the rewards of that, not these large multinational corporations. Like, what do you think just broadly, because this is a really loaded question, but what's your take yeah. on that in general? So I guess I'll start with the UBI. Um, it, I mean, I'm a fan of redistributing wealth back to the working class. Um, I am not happy with um, Andrew Yang's UBI. As yeah. a truck driver, and I've talked to other truck drivers, they typically have the same sentiment. Um, the whole point of his idea, at least the way he's marketed it, it, it as being universal, it's something that addresses the needs of everyone. But he made it originally exclusionary of you know people who are um, unemployed, who are uh, you know elderly on Social Security, who have disability, etc. And um, that was what you know problematic for most people. And they they addressed one uh, issue, which is Social Security. So mm -hmm. it no longer deducts from Social Security. But that means that they recognize that it was exclusionary, and they're still leaving everyone else out. Yeah. So it still deducts from, you know, your disability, etc. And that is why I don't support it. I don't think something a, a universal basic income that doesn't actually benefit the people who are struggling the most. I I don't think that's a really good way for this country to go. Because it's not truly um, universal in that sense, which is exactly. kind of my gripe with it as well. Right. If you just gave everyone, you know, a thousand dollars a month um, without any stipulations of it subtracts from your social security or your disability, et cetera, just or your unemployment, then I would be, you know, all in in support of it. Yeah. But ultimately, I think in this country, what we need to do is address the unfair dynamic between, you know, workers and their bosses, mm -hmm. right? And I don't think you can really get to the root of any of these problems without worker empowerment. Um, trucking is such a perfect example of this. We are pushed and pushed and pushed. And no matter how uh, big of a shortage of drivers there is, they don't want to increase pay. So they just want workers to work longer hours for lower wages. And that is why you see a truck driver making um, you know, $40,000 a year now where they were making that 20 years ago. Um, even though the, like, 
Exactly. Um, and, you know, nurses deal with the same stuff. Um, you know, welders deal with the same stuff. It's the entire country that's dealing with this. And I think that requires, um, you know, a, a full scale um, change in the culture of our country. Um, and it, it requires empowering unions, not just to continue uh, maintaining at the level they are, but to actually reverse it and get on the level of countries like Sweden and Denmark. Um, you know, a lot of these countries we look at who have these, uh, you know, programs like, you know, single payer and great education system, et cetera. They also have a very robust uh, you know, union in, in unionization in those country. I think that's what we're missing partially. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to strengthen workers. And, and one way I would do that um, to get people to be more willing to strike against their workers and to stand up against companies like Amazon would be providing, um, you know, uh, unemployment benefits for striking workers. Um, it would be, you know, subsidizing union uh, dues to completely uh, wipe out the entire argument against uh, um, unionization that these right to work uh, uh, supporters have have created that's a good idea um and also provide the infrastructure and the administrative administrative um support for newly forming forming unions and that should be all from the government and i think that would be a way to send um a message to uh you know the country and the people in this country that um you know here we're going to support workers we need to do that yeah that's fantastic Um, really great ideas with the subsidizing union um dues i didn't really think about that but i like how you're bringing all of these new ideas to the table like you're one candidate and you've gotten me to think about reparations for victims of you know marijuana being illegal in the past and subsidizing union dues these are great ideas so i know that a lot of people are going to be enthusiastic about your campaign one more time before you go tell us where we can donate what we can do to help support you and whatever you want to end with uh make your pitch man Okay, got it. Um, Well, the number one thing you can do is, you know, follow me on social media and, uh, you know, just keep an eye on my campaign. You can also go to Joshua2020.com. We need an army of volunteers. And like we need we have we have hundreds. We need thousands. And if you sign up there, I promise, you know, we will reach out to you and we will have something you can do for us, whether it's uh, even if you don't live in, in Washington, you know, we will have phone banking, text banking events. Good. And just generally keeping in touch with the with uh, our campaign and, uh, you know, helping us get um, in touch with the media and, and actually get people to cover our race. And that has been, you know, a, a huge help from you know what I've been doing on Twitter um, and my Twitter link uh, or my Twitter handle is uh, Joshua, the number four Congress. So it's Joshua for Congress. Um, and yeah, so that is what people can do to help. Um, And ultimately, our our ideas, I think that is the most important about the thing about this. You know, I'm, you know, it's a meme, you know, uh, um, Dave Rubin, (laughs) he loves to talk about ideas, but my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high level important ideas. I really am someone who's about ideas. You actually do have ideas. So (laughs) yeah, I have a lot of really good ideas, a lot of plans that are, you know, pushing the, the Overton window to the left where it needs to be. And, you know, just follow us, uh, you know, follow this campaign, sign up and, you know, we will actually win this race. And, uh, you know, if you want to be part of that, uh, again, it's Joshua2020.com. Well, look, you've dunked on Dave Rubin now, which you get bonus points for. You've dunked on Ben Shapiro. I mean, what's not to like? So Joshua Collins, 10th Congressional District of the state of Washington. Uh, Good luck. Hope to see you back on the show. And we'll be following this because I think that, um, you know, Denny Heck, a lot of people know he's a corporate Democrat, and I think that as time, you know, continues on, people are getting more and more frustrated. So I hope that, you know, you can be the catalyst to get him out. So good luck, man. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's all that I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in if you've made it this far. As usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which help the show not just to survive but thrive as well. Uh, I truly appreciate your viewership. So I'm going to bounce now. Um, I want to go play some Crash Team Racing. Uh, Pretty excited about that because it came out today. Um, Yeah, I'll talk to you all next week. Uh, This has been The Humanist Report, and I am Mike Figueredo. Take care.